All right, here we go. We have mm-hmm. famed actor Jason Mitchell. What up, Welcome what up, what up? to Vlad TV. Man, thank you for having me, bro. Of course, man. Longtime fan. Longtime fan. And you have a very dope career. Yeah. But as usual on Vlad TV, I want to start in the very, very beginning. So you're actually an army brat. So yes. you were born in Germany. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was born in Germany. <laughs> And uh, my older sister was born in Kitzigan, Germany, too. I was born in Wurzburg. But, like, before, I was really old enough to, you know, remember any of that. We had already moved to um, to New Orleans because that's where my mom originally from. Her and my dad got a divorce early on. And, you know, we went back to New Orleans. And uh, it, w- it was there after that. Yeah. Okay. And you actually grew up around the corner from Lil Wayne. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. I did. We both from the south side of Holly Grove. Um, we, we, I actually grew up with Mac Main too, who uh, who's from Holly Grove as well. You know what I mean? And a lot of these guys, I feel like, helped me dream big because a lot of the impossible didn't seem impossible to me. You know, it was like right there. But all we knew was was rap, you know, or sports. And I knew I didn't really... Well, to be honest, I got a little musical something, something. You know what I mean? I could rap, but I'm no Lil Wayne. I'm no Drake. You know what I mean? So I didn't like stand out above the crowd. So I knew how I had to find something that um that fit me. You know, and it, it took me some years. It took me a long time. You know, but um I, I think I think I found a nice little you know a little place to slip on my wiggle in. You know what I mean? <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, it turned out great. Right. Well, Wayne is like four years older than you, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah but so he's a little bit older. So it's not like you guys went to high school together or anything. But. Well, actually, um, no, nah, it's not like I went to high school with him. But when I was in the ninth grade, I believe, um, my last year at uh, this this high school called Fauche in New Orleans, it's, it's uptown, um, I went to school with, with Young Turk, actually. And him yeah. and, yeah, him and, him and Wayne was, you know... You know, they was joined at the hip back then. So, yeah, man. They was they was right above me. Right. And I guess your cousin was actually making beats on Wayne's uh, first Carter album? Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, um, man, shout out to, to the architects just in general. You know, they was they was a dope group of uh, producers. My cousin happened to be one of them. And they had this, they had a few studios actually, but that's when I actually first got to meet Wayne and really watch him. And I watch him record so much stuff, the prefix, a lot of the stuff from the first Carter. And that's when he and I really became friends. And it just kind of like, man, it blew my mind. That dude is like next level talented. You know what I mean? I saw him record a whole song one time. It was like, man. I don't like it. Let's start from the beginning. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm like, damn. But he don't write. He don't do none of that. You know what I mean? He light his little blunt and just go crazy. Like, that dude is extra talented, man. He's special. He was special to watch. Did you see Birdman around during this time? Not really. Not really. Birdman, you know, he he's like the the ultimate hustler, you know? And unfortunately, when you make it real big in New Orleans, you can't really stay there. You know what I mean? Like, I don't even think Wayne was staying there at the time, but he just, you know, had a good thing going with the architects. And we all know in this music industry, when you got a good relationship with producers, you want to keep that relationship and really build that because that's what make the music sound good, you know? And that's kind of what drew him to New Orleans at the time. But a lot of people who make it, man, if you make a certain amount of money, like having $100,000 in my city is damn near rich. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, you got to you gotta get out the way. You got to get out the way. Well, tell me about New Orleans in the early 2000s, because it has quite a quite a reputation, especially during that time. Right. I mean, well, I remember in the ninth grade, we, you know, you know how everybody sits around and has those talks about what they did during the summer and this and that. And like a guy who I was going to school with had caught three bodies over the summer. Like this was kind of the culture you know what I mean people were bringing guns to school they had a fight the first week of school where 120 something people got expelled like they used to have these huge gang fights and you know it's kind of hard not to fall into this 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 street life you know like the majority of my family had you know some type of charge or was some sort of drug dealer or or gambler you know and it was it was just hard to run away from, you know what I mean? Like even even guys like Soldier Slim, who was running it at the time, and 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 
and uh, you know, guys like Mac and C Murder, you know, that they was at the at the the, the height of their career at times and they were still one foot in the streets and one foot out the streets because it's just so hard. You have to really separate yourself. You know what I mean? There was so many murders. Like, my best friend was killed my 11th grade year. They shot him 17 times. You know what I mean? And it's just, it's something that becomes so regular and so normal that, like, PTSD is something that everybody's sitting with. You know? Well, you said you kind of dabbled in, in drug dealing at some yeah. point. Yeah, yeah. Uh like what was the most you ever did? And did you ever actually get caught during that time? Um, well, I actually didn't get caught till I was about 19. But you know, I you know, I I sold a little bit of this and sold a little bit of that, like early on, because you know, when you young, because I, I I have to say I had a a great mom, a praying mom. She was already in the church, but she was also a single mom, you know, and when me, my brother, and my sister, she would try to do everything that she could to get us what we needed, but we never could get what we wanted, you know? So as a young child, you know, it, that's all you know is that I want this or that I want that. So you go out into the streets early, even if it is to make, you know, five or $600 a week. Like that's a lot for, you know, somebody who 14, 15, 16 years old. Well, at 15, you had a tragedy. Yeah. Yeah, so um, when I was 15 years old, my, my dad shot himself in the head. Um, he was always dealing with a lot. Like I said, he was a military veteran. But also, um, I felt like he was away from us for too long, you know, and problems that he had with my mom or that he had with my sister, I think that he thought that my sister and I hated him because my brother has a different dad, right? So me and my sister were the two children that came from him. And I think he just, he got overwhelmed with the feeling of, of being alone, you know, and he ended up killing himself. And uh, I remember telling my mom, like, one day, like, I'm in my room and I'm like, I just don't feel like going to school today. So I go to my mom and she's in the kitchen and she used to work overnight, right? So she's like in there making breakfast. And the only time this would normally happen is like when we take in like the leap test or some kind of standardized testing where, you know, they say eat your breakfast in the morning and all of these things. So I'm already kind of looking like this is different, you know? And she uh, she says, um, you know, like how you feeling this morning or whatever? And I was like, actually... I just don't feel like going to school today. And she was like, well, you don't have to. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I need to do this more often. You know what I'm saying? I need to be like, hey, you know, give, give me some time to myself sometimes, you know, and see how it turns out. And she was like, you know, your daddy killed himself this morning. And I was like, no, I didn't, I didn't know that, you know? And uh, still to this day, I've never cried about it. My sister took it so hard and like, was just screaming, crying, like for, for almost an entire day. And I just, I couldn't even take it. And I just remember, you know, um, that being this strange sort of breaking point for me where I felt like I became the man of the house um, without any sort of preparation for it, you know? It was a scary feeling. I, I miss my dad. Yeah, I'm sorry if you're lost. I lost my dad a few, few years ago also. And um, it's nothing quite like losing your dad. I became more emotional afterwards. Like I cry easier now than I did back then because of that. So, yeah, man, I'm sorry. Yeah, man. I mean, you know, not having your father in your life affects you more than you know. Because you, when you're young and you have something like that happen, the first thing you do is, like, you get angry. Because, like, I feel like we could have talked about it. Or, he, you know, it, it would have just been nice to have my dad here. You know, like, an interesting fact about my dad, actually, that I didn't find out until after he killed himself was that he was one of the uh, fight coordinators for, uh, I believe it was Enter the Dragon, something with uh, with um, uh, Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris. Is that Enter the Dragon? I think so. Yeah, but he was, he was one of the fight coordinators, which was really cool. You know what I mean? Because, you know, he was a Green Beret and basically like a weapon, which was kind of dope. Yeah, so... Yeah, it's actually the way of the dragon. The way of the dragon. Okay. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. 
But yeah, my dad was a fight coordinator on that. And like, who knew? You know what I mean? He'd be proud as hell to know I was an actor right now. So yeah, yeah. man, shout out to him. Well, you're going to school and you graduate high school. And I guess you were planning on going to college, but then Katrina ends up hitting. You know, it was interesting because like, my high school was the fourth worst school in the nation at the time. Like literally, because they had a they had a killing at one of the other schools, um, very close to ours. My eleventh grade year, so you know, going into my twelfth grade year, you know, normally they give seniors like early release, and you have this whole like normal senior experience. It wasn't like that for us. They actually gave us these like bullshit electives that they just made up. It was like. PE3 and PE4 and stuff like that. You know what I mean? So like, you know, for the most part, a lot of kids would just skip school and just do whatever. But like, I never got any real guidance from my school. So I didn't know what I wanted to do with myself, you know? And I was kind of like already in the streets a little bit. So when Katrina hit, a lot of people was taking opportunities to like, you know, go to Grambling and go to all these different places. And I'm like, yo, bro, honestly... I don't really know what I want to do with my life enough to go to a college because, you know, rather you believe it or not, like Sally may going to be on your ass. You know what I'm saying? They might be giving you this this free ride right now because of because of Katrina. But like college ain't going to be free. Like, I don't care what y'all say. You know what I mean? And I was too afraid to to go to college for like general studies or something like that and then end up in debt and still not knowing what I wanted to do with my life. And to be honest, that happened to like a lot of my friends and and family as well. You know what I mean? They just ended up in debt. And me, I tried to just jump straight into the work world. So um, I kind of started picking up little uh, little odd crafts. You know what I mean? And um, I found cooking, and and I started doing like electrical work as well. You know what I mean? Still kind of one foot in the streets and just doing whatever I could do to make me some money, but that also um, I could be the boss of. That makes sense. You know what I mean? I, I always had this entrepreneurial spirit about myself. And um, yeah, it, it was good to be able to find a couple a couple things that I could use my hands and get that instant gratification. You know what I mean? Because it's just something about when you cook for somebody and, you know, they have something that they never had in their life. For instance, like a, like a charbroiled oyster, right? They're famous in New Orleans, and a lot of people are like, man, I don't eat oysters. If I make you some oysters, you're going to love them. You know, and I've watched people's lives change right before my eyes. And it's the same thing, like, if I if I wire a whole studio, you know, and then when I hit the switch and it all lights up, it's like, damn, you get this, this instant gratification that, like, you know, nobody could take that from you. Nobody could take those skills from you. Like, I could still get out here and do some construction. <laughs> Yeah, I just want to say, uh, you know, you mentioned food. New Orleans is one of my favorite restaurant cities. And in fact, Commander's Palace is one of my all-time favorite restaurants. That's dope. Commander's Palace, I actually just went there the last time I was in New Orleans. But yeah, we definitely famous for the restaurants, you know. And I've oh, worked yeah. for quite a few of them. I worked for, uh, like, Drago's is a mom and pop that kind of is getting to the chain point now. But, you know... We helped them start that business from the ground. You know what I mean? I, I was I was an oyster shucker. I that was like my first cooking. Well, actually, my first cooking job was at a restaurant called Houston's. You know what I mean? It's like oh yeah, I yeah, they're a pretty big chain. But that was like yeah. my 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 first experience as a cook. I was a fry cook there, and um, yeah, I've I've worked for Drago's. I've worked for Mister Ed's, like a, a few different places. You know, and um, it was kind of good for me because in that. And that time I was kind of finding acting at the same time. So they were like flexible jobs, you know what I mean? Well, I'd be like, look, I'm gonna go do this audition and come right back. Cause I couldn't, you know what I mean? I didn't want to get in no trouble. I just kind of wanted to uh to to find a place to be able to release something, you know, which was which was dope, you know. Well, speaking of acting, so I guess while doing these odd jobs, you went to an acting workshop. Yes. Yes. Okay, so um, I'm riding with one of my partners one day, and we hear this ad on the radio, like, you know, there was this lady named Jacqueline Fleming who just started this acting class, and she had just come from L.A., and my partner's like, man, you should do it, because I always do, like, different voices and different impressions, and 
stuff like that. They like, bro, you you always be having everybody laughing. Like, you should try that shit. So I'm like, all right, cool. But you know, we was just riding around bullshit, and like, you know, nobody wrote the number down and nothing. So, um, like a week later, one of my homies she asked me, he like, bro, what happened to the acting class? Did you ever go? And I was like, well, I mean, nobody wrote the number down. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, you know, like, you know, it was it was a good conversation at the time. But, you know, it was what it was. And he remembered the number off the top of his head. So I was like, damn, okay. All right, so I, like, took it as a sign from God. You know what I mean? So I went there. You know I got all these fucking tattoos. So I wore, like, a a, a, a three-piece suit. You know what I mean? <laughs> and try to, like, get her to let me in the class. And she was like, I'm going to be honest with you, Jason. Um, You're terrible. But if you stick with this, it, it, it could really work out for you. So I'm like, I ain't really care. I just wanted a place to be able to go to make new friends. You know what I mean? Because on one side, here I am, you know, trying to find these, trying to stick to these odd jobs. It really wasn't enough money, so I still got like one foot in the streets. But, you know, my best friend had just got killed. I had some other people that, because in, like, in the streets, it's never what you think it is, right? It's always friends killing friends, people who know each other, setting each other up and Stuff like that. And it's like never like you think it is on TV where it ain't no snitching and all of that. Like, no, nah, everybody's pillow talking. Somebody know the whole story. Somebody going to tell the police and they're going to come to your house and they're going to find you. You know what I mean? And I remember. like, Who is beating on my door like the police? Who is that? Police. And you're like, oh, shit. You know what I mean? And your heart just drops and they tell you like, yo, we know this and we know and it's like damn so I just felt my world just closing in on me you know and my sister would always tell me like it's them niggas you hang out with you need to find you some new friends and you know so I just I looked at my acting class like yo this is my way to finally find new friends potentially find something better to do with myself you know just on a day-to-day basis I didn't really think that I was gonna be a a big actor you know because you know, when you look at people like Wendell Pierce and and Anthony Mackie, guys who are originally from New Orleans, they still had to go to New York or go to L.A. in order to have a career, you know? But at the time, it had just started bubbling in New Orleans and people were shooting movies there. They was doing a bunch of movies there. So I was like, in the right place at the right time. You know, and and God gave me this gift that I didn't even know I had because I mean, like, I don't know, maybe five weeks into the class, I ended up getting signed by this lady named Tasha Smith. Um, I got maybe I don't know four or five auditions, and then I ended up booking this thing called Texas Killing Fields with uh with with Jason Clark and Sam Worthington, you know. And Chloe Moretz, you know what I mean? But at the time, like, I'm fresh out the hood. So I'm like, you know, there's a bunch of white people in this movie. You know what I'm saying? I don't really know these people like that. So all I could think was, I need more, I need more, I need more. Like, I was never an extra on set. I didn't know anything about it. Like, Chloe was literally walking me around, like, skipping, like, come on, I'll show you. You know, and, like, taking me to the to lunch. And they got a bunch of extras sitting on the other side. And there's this huge table of food. And she's like, yeah, get whatever you want. And I'm like, you sure? Like, she was like, why they can't? She was like, no, this is for us. They have to wait until, you know, after, after, um, after we eat and to eat. And I'm like, what? So I'm just getting this, like, this, this, uh, this push to the front of the line. You know what I mean? And it's, it's all God's work. But I, like I said, I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. So, um, yeah, I ended up doing two more movies with, uh, with, with Mark Wahlberg, Broken City and Contraband, and I did this other film with uh, Kung Lee. And, uh, man, why is why am I drawing a blank on his name right now? Um, Jean-Claude Van Damme. <laughs> ah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, which was crazy, you know? But all of this stuff was, like, in New Orleans or, or neighboring cities, you know what I'm saying? So I could literally jump in my car and drive and be what they call a local hire, you know? But I was just really lucky at the time. And what's so crazy about it is that, to be honest, I first jumped in this thinking that I would have to wear this mask and be afraid to be 
the person who I was and have the the experience that that I had. But honestly, those first four roles that I booked, you know, were like off the things that I was trying to hide, you know, my tattoos, my accent, you know, people loved it. They was like, come on, nah, you know, he has a beautiful smile. You know what I mean? Like, nah, let's do it. I remember when um <laughs> when we worked with Bolt on uh on Contraband, he was like, um, let's let's uh should we go shirt on or shirt off? And then Bolt's like, let's see it with the shirt off. And I take my shirt off and I got all these tattoos. And he was like, definitely shirt off. We're gonna use that. So I'm like, damn. You know, so it was it was just a blessing to be able to um be embraced by this world that I thought was gonna push me out. You know, and then um I did those four movies and then after that. Yeah, Compton. It took off. So, Contraband with Mark yeah. Wahlberg. Yeah. That was your first, like, in a big international release. Yes. Right? Yes, yes. And they're about to have the premiere in France. They're going to fly you out. But things didn't go that way. Right, 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 right. So, um, I was actually doing, like, this, this small play at the time, right? And uh, we're leaving rehearsal and we get pulled over because we're like in this Monte Carlo, but apparently this Monte Carlo, uh, like the, that was like kind of like the it car at the time, right? People were, were in the Monty's and stuff and um, it fit the description for some sort of robbery or something like that. So they pull us out thinking it's about the robbery. And they got this whole charge on there, like, yeah, so they take me to jail to, like, violate my probation, right? Because I was on probation at the time. So they violate me, sit me down for, like, 90 days, bro, for nothing. It was just something. I didn't, I didn't even do nothing. And I'm sitting there reading the newspaper, you know, watching the commercials on TV, like, bro, I'm in this movie. I'm supposed to be in France at... You know, at the at the premiere and everybody's like, man, whatever. Actors don't go to jail, man. You tripping. You know what I mean? And I'm like, no, seriously, bro. I'm supposed to be in here. And it was like the worst feeling in the world. Like, damn, how do I just keep backtracking? You know what I mean? As soon as I think my blessing falls into my lap, this is like the first international open like this. You know what I mean? Nobody had ever done that before, Mark Wahlberg. So, um, yeah, supposed to be in France and and just really felt down about everything. But it was like a blessing in disguise, right? Because I was really on probation for Texas, but um the way it works is like if you're in a neighboring state, you can pay them like an extra twenty five bucks a month to your probation officer or whatever and just report to them. So my probation officer never reported to Texas at all. So to Texas, they're looking at it like, oh, okay, well, you just are delinquent. You ain't been paying us. You ain't been coming to see your probation officer. And I'm like, no, I got everything. I got all my receipts. You know what I mean? So they they waited until literally day 89 of these 90 days to come pick me up from, from New Orleans to bring me to, to Brownwood, Texas, right? So they got me shackled like a dog in the back of a, a charger between two other guys. And we we take this like 15 hour ride in the back of this charger, just balled up. And I get there and um I, I see a judge maybe after maybe like two days or something like that. And I'm like, nah, you know, I got everything. I had my mom bring all my receipts. <laughs> and um not only did they, you know, accept my my story, well not my story, but my plea. But they also let me off probation after that. And it was like the blessing that I needed because I couldn't just leave the state. I couldn't even just leave the city without, you know, some sort of permission to do so. And right after that happened, it it kind of was the door that I needed to open for me to be able to go do Straight Outta Compton. Okay, so let's talk about Straight Outta Compton. So you've gotten a few roles. I mean, they're not major roles yet. Right. How did you first hear about Straight Outta Compton? So, I had been reading for some big for some big roles like for a while. You know, like I read for um, 
this movie called uh, The Lottery Ticket with Bow Wow. And I'm going back and forth to Atlanta, like, you know, doing a bunch of auditions time after time after time, just what they call chemistry reads, right? Like, like Brandon T. Jackson actually was the guy who ended up getting the role that I was going for, you know? So they were looking for, like, this, like, little gang of people who hung out on the porch and, you know, would kind of uh, have these scenes with Bow Wow. So this guy, I'll never forget him. His name is Mark Fink Cannon. He pulls me out of the room. He takes his glasses off, and he was like, Jason, you're going to have a great career. But unfortunately, on camera, you look too much like Bow Wow. And unfortunately for you, the world knows who he is. So he's going to sell more tickets, you know? And, like, it would make sense if you guys were, like, brothers or something in the movie, but we need somebody who doesn't look too much like him. So I'm thinking to myself, fuck, like, this is just so discouraging, you know? So my agent, she knew I was kind of going through this, right? Because every actor has this happen. Like, you get so many more no's than yeses. So she pulls up to my house one day, which she never does, and she was like, I got something for you I think you could really, really get. So I'm like, what is it? So... She's like, yes, yeah, it's, it's this movie straight out of Compton. They 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 um they gave you an audition for Easy E. I'm like, wait a minute. You know, so uh, they got some swing and a miss out there. I'm not gonna lie. You know, normally for these uh these biopics, like they're hard to land. Like a lot of people have tried, and the movie was a swing and a miss. You know, so initially, I'm thinking to myself like. If this ain't going to be some crazy big picture movie, like, it could be the wrong thing for me to do. And she was like, nah, Ice Cube's involved, Universal's involved, Dr. Dre is involved. I'm like, oh, yes. So they ain't going to mess it up. Like, they ain't going to mess up their own shit. You know what I mean? So I'm like, all right, let's do it. So what's funny about this whole situation, like I, I was saying before, I used to do all of these different impressions. And... I always thought that it was funny being from New Orleans because, you know, we got like, I don't know what language that we actually speak, but it's definitely not English. You know what I mean? Like, we still working on proper English. So we thought it was funny to to hear these guys like Lorenz Tate, you know, and, and, and old dog, you know, you hear these these gangsters talking on TV like, hey, Buster. You know, they they pronounce every syllable of every word and all of that. So I always used to, like, mock this this California accent. So I'm thinking to myself, like, I might be able to really do this, you know? So I go over these scenes. It's like five or six scenes. And um, I go to this lady, Megan Lewis, and, and we put it on tape, right? And Megan, she's like, she's from Boston, so... She's every bit of Boston. She's one of those casting directors who actors fear. Like, she, she's not there to be your friend at all. You know, she's just really not friendly. But after this specific audition, you know, I'm, I'm crying at the end because it was like these, uh, the hospital scenes that I had to do at the end, right? So I'm like crying. Butterflies are leaving my stomach. I'm like, oh, I got through it. So I look up and Megan's crying. And I'm like, what? She double high fives me, walk me to my car. I'm like, wait, this is not the Megan Lewis that I know. Like, you know, this is a whole different lady for sure. But she was like, nah, like, I really, really think that you can get this. So I'm like, all right. So maybe like 30 days passed, bro. I'm thinking, you know, I might have did a good job, but like, they ain't going to call me. And then they call me and they're like, F. Gary Gray, the director, wants to um have you fly out to uh, Los Angeles. And I'm like, well, you know. <laughs> The way my life's set up, you know what I'm saying? I can't exactly just move around like that, right? Because this was before the probation letter came that said that I was free. So um, I'm like, ah, I don't really know if I could do that, you know? And uh, I don't know if I can afford that. Because if I come out there and it's not a for sure yes that I got the part, like it could be just wasted money, right? So this is before Zoom and all that. This was when Skype was out. So he was like, uh, they called me back in like 30 minutes and was like, he just wants to Skype with you. Like, okay, cool. So um, we Skyped for an hour and 17 minutes. <laughs> we did, I mean, it's just like me and you on this virtual situation right now. Like, you know, we was going back and forth at it, at it, at it. And then, um, yeah, man. That's how I booked straight out of Compton without even flying to California. I had ever been to California ever in my life. Like, you know, yeah, it was it was a big deal. How'd you feel 
when you were told that you got the role? You know, what's crazy about that is I never actually heard those words. I never heard those words. You booked it or you got it. None of that. So we went out, did some more chemistry reads, right? Because I, um, I was going through this process helping them find Ice Cube and Dr. Dre, right? So I'm out there for like a week going through all these different auditions and all of these different people. And they got me there with this guy named Aaron Spicer, who's like, he's like a Susan Batson, you know, or, or a Dustin Felder, one of those guys who's behind the scenes, but like is one of those celebrity acting coaches, you know? So he's like, yeah, man, you know, just throw some different shit at him. You know, just, just take your time when you're doing this. Just give him good stuff to react to. You know, catch him off guard, punch him in the face. I'm like, okay, you know, so I'm just doing what I do. But in my mind, I'm thinking, I don't see no other person who's auditioning for Easy E. But at the same time, from what I heard, his daughter wanted to play it. One of his sons wanted to play it. Like, you know, so wait, I didn't wait, know. wait, wait. His his daughter wanted to play Easy E. Yeah, what? E B was like, yeah, you can dress me up and you know, makeup can make me look like a guy. It'll be like an Oscar winning performance. You know what I mean? Like she okay. definitely wanted to try. She was okay. like, I look so much like him. I was like, all right. You know what I mean? But um yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah, on the day, um I I never forget I when I first met O'Shea, they were like, you know, what is, so who do you think should play Ice Cube? And I pointed him out and I'm like, you know, he's He's great, you know, but they didn't really believe in him that much because he had never really acted in nothing else. He had been working with uh, Susan Batson for like the last two years, though. But I'm like, he's raw, but he's good. You know what I mean? And he looks freakishly like like Ice Cube. And I didn't, you know. So I, I look on the paper and I see his name and I'm like, yo, O'Shea Jackson Jr. You know, I'm just using my better judgment and I'm going to go ahead and throw this out and say you're his son. And he was like, yeah, yeah, you know. And I, I just couldn't believe that they had him sitting through this process, right? And it wasn't until then that it clicked in my mind, like, wait, I might be the only easy E, right? So um, I asked Aaron, I'm like, bro, is there anybody else like auditioning for Easy E? And he was like, do you see anybody else? And I was like, what the fuck, you know? So I went to somebody else, a producer, uh, my friend, Mercedes Lindsay. I went to her and was like, there anybody else? She was like, do you see anybody else? I'm like, what the fuck? Why is everybody giving me the same answer? Right? So they ended up flying me back home. And then a week later, they called me out. And they were like, yeah, um, we're ready to start pre-production. So you guys can start rehearsals and stuff. And I was like, so I got it? They was like, oh, yeah. Um, your agent didn't talk to you? And I was like, what the fuck, man? Nobody ever actually said the words, you got the role. Not even my agent, which was crazy. So I was like, damn. So... It was one of those moments where, like, I had to lick myself in the mirror and be like, you got it. <laughs> yeah, crazy. Well, I did an interview with Lil Easy mm -hmm. uh, around the time of that movie. Mm -hmm. And he really felt like he was going to get the role. Because he looks like Easy e Absolutely. right? Same builds, same, you know, complexion, same facial features and everything right. else like that. But he ultimately didn't get the role, and he felt some type of way about it, especially because Ice Cube's son got to play Ice Cube, whereas Easy E's son didn't get to play Easy E. Do you feel that um, Ice Cube had the resources Most to, to put his that's, son that's through all the acting classes, and you may not have had the same level yeah, of resources? Yeah, but that's not that's not his that's not his his job to do. You right. know what I mean? But it's that's common sense. Yes, you know what I mean. His, his father is. You know, movie after movie, cute vision, you know, I'm doing box office movies, you know, now as we see, ride along to, you know, you switch from comedy to family, from the street side, you know what I mean? You did the crossover, I, like I told the man, it's like I, I, I you know what I'm saying, I, I respect your your legacy, you know what I mean? It's something that I would, I, I can mimic and sit there and try to do myself and want to get into movies, so it was a, it was a good chance for me to do an unpolished act of an individual person that I'm playing that's not hard for me to do. You can ask his mama. Right. So my first experience with Lil Easy was actually like, cause he did a couple interviews around that time where 
in so many words, he made me feel like it was going to be Halloween for whoever showed up to play this role. Because if somebody was going to fuck it up, it might as well be him. Quite naturally, like, that's his son. You know, like, he look exactly like that man. Like, he should be first in line to be able to do it. But, you know, his acting skills just wasn't where mine were. You know what I mean? So after I found out that I was going to, you know, be coming back out to L.A., I'm thinking, shit, I might need some niggas on the ground. I ain't never been out here before. Like, I need to find out what this is about to be now, right? So I get on Facebook. I find everybody that I could find that's related to Eric, just period. So I end up getting his number and called him and was like, bro, we had like a three-hour conversation. You know what I mean? And after I told him how I felt about it, and and what it meant to me and me being from New Orleans, you know what I mean? Because he was like, the worst feeling in the world for him would have been some British actor or some shit that came in that didn't know shit about this whole culture and just messes it up. You know what I mean? And I felt him on that because this was a big thing. Like, even even his death has this huge conspiracy around it and all of this stuff. And, like, he was such a big footprint that... You know, you that ain't something that you could just come and mess up. This is too important of a story to tell. So it went from him having this attitude like it's going to be Halloween to him pretty much having the welcome wagon waiting on me when I got to to uh, to California for the first time. So literally the day I flew in, you know, um, first Shay took me to this place called Barry's that has like this amazing lobster pizza that they feel like everybody should try. When you go to <laughs> when you go to L.A. And then I met up with Lil Easy. You know, he started, like, introducing me to different people. And uh, that kind of got interesting as well. Because I had no, I, I wasn't soaking up the fact that he had seven different baby mamas and, and, and nine kids. So I was just reaching out to all these different kids. You know, but their mamas kind of didn't all get along and shit. So they was like, Jason, you trying to start some shit. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm just trying to, you know, gather as much information as possible. So, you know, I, I was sitting down with different family members and shit like that, but Easy kind of had all of that set up, you know, and he he came on set a bunch of times and really supported me. You know what I mean? I got a lot of respect and love for that dude. That's my guy. Well, yeah, and just to be fair, O'Shea Jackson Jr. went to USC film school. Yes. And really took it seriously. Like you said, he had that acting coach for multiple years, and he still had to audition, and he yes. still had to go up against other ice cubes in order to get that role. Lil Easy, from my understanding, didn't go through those same steps. Exactly. And, no, you he, know, he, unfortunately, he you know, when it comes to these big budget $15 million films, a lot's riding on it. Exactly. Exactly. You know, and the way Gary was looking at it was like, listen, this could potentially be my Oscar. Like, he knows where he stands in the film world. And he ain't got time to be trying to pat people back, you know what I mean, and make them feel good by, you know, like putting them in positions that they shouldn't be in. So he wasn't really like, you know, what's so funny. They were going back so going back and forth so much with him and um and uh this other guy who ended up being. Do you remember that scene in Straight Outta Compton where we're about to fight those guys from New York who come in and I like grab the bottle and shit. The main guy who was talking his shit, who's on power now, I believe his name is like Marcus or something. He ended up leaking something that he was going to be Dr. Dre, but he auditioned for both Dr. Dre and Ice Cube, right? <laughs> so so he ended up leaking something on the internet saying that he was going to be it. And when we found out that Corey got it, um, Gary decided to give him this role that he knew as soon as we saw his face, we was going to be like, motherfucker. You know what I mean? So we didn't know who these guys were going to be. So when he walked in the studio and on set that day, we was all looking at him like, what the fuck? Like, it was crazy. Like, that guy's a genius, man. That guy that guy's a genius. Shout out to F. Gary Gray, man. <laughs> so on August 5th, 2014, yeah. you guys start filming yeah. Straight Outta Compton. Yeah. Seven days later, there's a drive-by shooting on set. Yeah, and you know, it was crazy because I remember us walking from um from base camp to, to set, right? And they always got like cop cars and 
shit taped off or whatever, just to make sure, you know, people don't just come onto the set. So they got a guy out there laid out. Cop cars are there and shit. And um, they're like, no, nah, you got to go around. And we like, hey, we part of the movie. You know what I mean? You don't see the get up. You know what I mean? And he was like, this ain't a part of the movie. We was like, what the fuck, man? It was crazy because all of these people who are out watching this happen, it didn't hit them that, that this wasn't part of the movie. So they literally watched this broad daylight killing and then... It wasn't until like 20 minutes later that everybody was like, oh my God, this is real. You know what I mean? Which was kind of crazy. I had never experienced no shit like that before. Well, yeah. According to reports, uh, a group of men that were standing outside the Compton courthouse mm -hmm. flashed, flashed gang signs at a car that was passing by. Mm -hmm. People in the car pulled out guns and just started shooting. Right. And one person, <laughs> one person got hit. Was he killed? I believe so. Okay. I believe so. Right. Yeah. No one, you know, around the production was hurt, but the production was supposed to be right there. So exactly. here you are seeing this insanity in, in Compton and it's like, yo, what the hell? Yeah, it was crazy. I was just like, you know, for me, because there were some things about the gang culture that like, you know, I had to learn and go study myself. But a lot of stuff production to help you out with, right? Like if you feel like you need a dialect coach or you feel like you need a nutritionist, whatever, like, you know, they'll help you out with that. But I asked them, you know, like, can y'all bring me, you know, to where Easy is from? Like, can I go to Kelly Park and can I go to these different? And they're like, hell no. Nah. <laughs> you definitely can't do that. Like, it's it's too serious. And I was like, you know, I'm from a dangerous city. Like, come on, man. Like, it can't be that bad, right? So I remember going down there, like, by myself, I ended up getting somebody else to take me, right? So we go, and I see Piru Street for the first time, and I'm like, oh, this is where Piru comes from. So I get out of the car to take a selfie, and everybody's like, no, 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 no. Get back in the car. Like, no, we can't do that. You know what I mean? Like, you're taking this shit too far. So I'm like, what is happening? Like, I don't see nobody outside. And they was like, yeah, because they got laws that literally, if you're three or more people standing outside in these neighborhoods, they could just come pat you down because the gang shit is crazy. You know? And at first, I think I was taking it very, very lightly until... You know, we saw that, and that shit was a trip. I'm like, it's crazy. You know what I mean? Because it, it's really as simple as, hey, where you from, homie? And then if you feel like you from a gang set and they about to back out on you, you just back out on them, and they just start shooting at each other instantly just off those few introduction words. You know what I mean? <laughs> Which is, it, it was it was kind of a culture shock for me. You know, it was, it was, it was crazy. I didn't see some violence, but that shit was different. Well, yeah, I remember my first interview with Lil Easy. This was, this was before Vlad TV. This was like maybe 2006 when I was still doing DVDs, and he asked me to meet him at his at you know Easy's grandparents' house. Right, right, right. In, in Kelly Park, I believe. Yeah, right? yeah. So, so I pull up, and I'm you know this was I'm broke. I'm by myself. I'm holding the camera. Right. You know, I have I have no one with me. I, I have no weapons on me. Nothing. But okay, I'm getting this interview. Right. Right. So, so we pull up, and you know he he comes outside. He meets me. You know we find a little spot. You know by the car that we're gonna film him outside. And I'm, I'm I always remember this. Me and him actually talked about this in our interview. Before the interview started, someone walked up to him and handed him a pistol. He he took the pistol in his, you know, in his pants. Mm. This is all off camera. This is not him fronting for the camera, right? Right. He he took took the pistol in his pants and we start doing the interview and every few seconds as he's talking, he's like right turning around. His, right. his head is on a swivel. Right. And I'm filming this going like where the fuck am I right now? And <laughs> how come I don't have a gun? Right. And, and what, what what what's about to happen? Like, is a drive-by about to happen right now? Because clearly he's he's aware of a level of danger that's happening in his you know in his own neighborhood. Exactly. And, and, I, and I always remember this. I remember he he ties like, oh yeah, well yeah no. He's like, yeah, I think the gun was there so I could protect you, you know, just in case and something right. something something. But it's like you're right. It's that type of environment in Compton like that. Yeah, you got to damn near have like a, a, a recon swivel. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, you got to have damn near this, this, this army level of thinking, like, because it could happen at any time. And that's how it is. Like, people wait for you to, to put your guard down so they can fucking hop out or come out, you know, the cut of somebody's house or whatever. And, and it's, you feel extra responsible when you bring people into your world. 
You know what I mean? And you like, cause I, I got to go to that same house actually, but again, couldn't get out the car. Cause they're like, how are we going to explain this to, to production if some shit happened to you, you know? And it's just, it's it's sad that we go through this in, in, in our neighborhoods, man. That's why like, when I first watched the movie in LA and you saw those two rags get tied together and held up, like I seen real gang members crying, like, because it's so real. Like, so many of them done been lost. Like, you know, so many of them have been killed. Like, think about Nipsey. Even, like, after all that he's done, you still not safe in your own neighborhood. Like, that's where shit happens to you. And it's just, it's scary, man. It's scary. Well, you guys are working on the movie, and Dre and Cube and Yella are all heavily involved in it. Yeah. They're on set all the time and everything else like that. And there was this one instance when uh, you were at Roscoe's with your mom and your stepdad yeah. and Dr. Dre pulls up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's like, he calls and he's like, bro, where you at? And I'm like, I'm at Roscoe's with my mom, you know, my stepdad. And he's like, did you drive? And I'm like, nah. He was like, good, I'm going to send a car. Y'all going to meet me at Jimmy's. I'm like, okay. You know, so I'm like trying to absorb this, right? So we walk out, get in the car. So we go to Jimmy's, right? And um, when we open the door, like I had never met Jimmy Iovine at this time. So they open the door and there's like a, a guy in a polo shirt, you know, and he's like, how you doing? You know, so I, I reached for his hand. I'm like, how you doing? He was like, right this way. You know, I'm like, what the hell? You know what I mean? And then we get to the next person that has on like a polo shirt and like, right this way. I'm like, who has staff at their crib, you know? So as we walking down the hallway, I could hear my voice and it was the hospital scenes, right? So I'm telling my mom, I'm like, yo, I think that's my voice. That's my voice. And like, by the time we got to the end of the hallway and we could see the TV, I already had tears in my eyes, right? And Dre just starts cracking up laughing. Like, I knew we was going to get him. I knew he was going to get him. And, um, yeah, man, that was that was my first time seeing those hospital scenes with Dr. Dre, Jimmy Iovine, you know, his wife and kids just sitting there on his couch, like chilling in his crib. And it blew my mind, man. It really did. Like, and that's a moment I'll never forget, for sure. For sure. I'm super thankful for those guys. Well, you guys are still filming. The movie's coming together. And then January 29th, 2015. Suge Knight decides to show up to Compton. Right. Uh, apparently, he's unhappy at the way he's being depicted in the movie. And also, he's not getting paid for his depiction. So, Suge being Suge, uh, him and Terry show up to Compton. There was a couple different movements that happened. But ultimately, he ends up getting into it with uh, Bone. He starts getting beat up in the car. He backs up and then he goes forward, ends up running over Bone and ends up killing Terry. Yeah, so I feel like they got a few different stories out there. So I'm going I'm to clear this shit up. You know what I mean? It, it, it is what it is. I wasn't actually there personally because this is when, um, you know, Cube and Dre were shooting a commercial. So we all know Dre and Suge don't see eye to eye. Right, but we had this other scene actually where we were shooting um the very beginning of the movie when I'm walking up to the trap house. The night that we shot that, there was a, a rumor that the bloods was gonna press us for sure. Right? Mm. So because technically what a lot of people don't know is after you become a public figure, they really didn't have to pay him shit. You know what I mean? They didn't have to give Suge anything. They didn't have to care about how he felt like he was depicted. None of that mattered to, to Universal or anybody else, right? But um, that night specifically, you know, security got really tight. I just remember, like, us getting some extra beef in security, like, out of nowhere. Like, what the fuck? It was, like, 2 in the morning, and then a bunch of other people show up at security, and they were telling us, like, hey, look, don't go past this area, don't go past that area. It was, it was really serious. And it was something that Bone also took serious, right? Because Bone and TC, they, they two people who, um, like, if you're going to shoot in the jungles or you're going to shoot in South Central or any, like, real hood in L.A., these guys are going to make sure you safe, right? So um, 
it was to everybody's understanding that Suge was not ever supposed to show up on set and no random ass bloods was supposed to show up on set and it was supposed to be regulated and governed properly, right? So um, Suge and Dre ended up making the executive decision like, yo, after the movie's over, we're going we gonna to break him off a check. You know what I mean? We don't fuck with him like that, but I mean, it is what it is. Like, he's, he's a big character in this movie, whatever, we're going to break him off a check. And Bone and TC didn't get that memo, right? So when, when, when Suge came, instantly they put hands on him because what the fuck are you doing here? You talking about a check that you're supposed to be picking up and all of this shit? Like, nah, we told you that it was going to be violation if you showed up. You know what I mean? So they in instantly end up putting hands on him. You know what I mean? And these are two guys who you really don't want to run with anyway. So that's why he tried to back up and get out of there. And it was really just a freak accident. You know, he ended up running over Bone's leg and fucking his leg up. And he, he fucking killed TC. You know what I mean? And it's crazy because for me, I'm looking at it like, Karma is crazy, you know what I mean? Like, I've never met Suge Knight, but we've all heard rumors about what he's done and, like, you know, shit that he was involved with. But on that day, it was supposed to be a smooth situation where he was just coming to pick up a check from Ice Cube, and it was something that they had already talked about, you know? So it, it, was, it was more of a sad situation than anything, you know what I mean? But if you ask me, like, karma is real, bro. You know, and that day it just it just caught up with him. Like all the shit that he had gotten away with in the past, he didn't. You know, he didn't get away that time. And it's sad that TC had to lose his life over that bullshit because it was really some bullshit, man. It was a misunderstanding. But um, yeah, yeah, that's what happened. Right, and Suge ultimately got twenty eight years in prison, uh, twenty two years for killing Terry, and then six years because it was his third strike. Right. Uh, and this is where he is right now. Right. You know, and it, yeah. it's sad. But like I said, it's, it's it's karma, man. Like, energy is a real thing, you know? Like, because if he didn't have that energy swarming his head anyway, he wouldn't have had TC and Bone on his ass. You know what I mean? Like, he, he you know, got Well, he, he came with situation. Terry Carter. Terry Carter wasn't an aggressor. He came with Terry. That's what ha that's what they say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what happened. Terry was his friend, and they came together, and Terry was there to kind of smooth everything along. So Terry never attacked him. So oh, he so ran over was, Terry. It was, so it was Bone put hands on him, and he tried Bo to back Bo out and just ended up running he over Terry out, on accident. Hit Bone, and then after running over Bone, he ended up hitting Terry on accident and killing Terry. Man, that's crazy. Yeah, and that's then of course crazy. there was the whole you know murky aspect of. What exactly happened when, because someone walked up and, and Bone handed him something. They were saying that it was a gun, but Bone was saying it was a walkie-talkie. Right. And then when the trial started to begin, there was all this witness tampering shit that happened and lawyers ended up getting arrested and losing oh. the licenses. And it was, it was a clusterfuck on a lot of different levels. Man, that's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. But it was one of them sad situations, you know what I mean? And if you ask me, I feel like, Bone being the stand-up guy that he is, you know, and also somebody who was an ambassador for the blood set for, for years on end, especially in the film world, like you can't you can't walk into somebody else's shit and like and put all of this noise in the room. You know what I mean? Because you're making it bad for us. Like we are honest people trying to make honest livings. You know, he he's got a lot of um people location money and, and, and a lot of extras involved. And, you know, like he's trying to bring the film community to his city and, you know, to his neighborhood. And if you put that in danger, you know, you can only imagine that that nothing good can come from that. You know what I mean? Because Bone has always been a stand-up guy, man, a really good dude, and has done a ton of movies that, that nothing has went wrong on. You know what I mean? So, yeah, man, a lot of love for that guy, too. Well, ultimately, on August 11th of 2015, the movie gets released, uh, ends up earning $200 million at the box office, which with a, a roughly $50 million budget is considered a huge success. Uh, it got nominated for Best Original Screenplay at the Oscars. 
Uh, and then there's a lot of other awards that you got and the, the crew got and the directors got and everyone else got. So ultimately, you know, and this even led up to NWA being, you know, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Which, right. right. You know, right. the timing of it was clearly based on the movie as well. So ultimately, everyone looked at this whole project as a success. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it, it was a trip to... um to sort of go through the process because it was all happening so fast, right? Like when they did the the release in um in the States, because we went on the the like the premiere run or whatever, but the film wasn't out yet, right? And then we went and did a premiere run in in Europe and the movie was coming out here during that time and it just exploded. You know what I mean? So they constantly telling us like, yo, the movie's doing good, the movie's doing numbers, all of that. But like we moving around so fast that we kind of like, you know, not really being able to get the full experience, right? And then we go to Germany. Bro, listen, I had never seen my face so big. It was these draped posters that were so incredibly large that like, Literally, me, Shay, and Corey are just standing there, staring up at him like, damn. Like, this is crazy. You know what I mean? It's already crazy enough. I just went through, like, I just got off a jet with Ice Cube. So, like, I'm, like, in, in full awe, right? And then you can start hearing the commotion, and I look down, and there's people who are in full sprint. I'm talking about stampede. Like, there were people who fell, and people ran on top of them. You know what I mean? Real life stampede shit. And I'm like, oh my God. So they start grabbing us and we're like beelining it to this stage, right? We get to the stage. Well, no, they bring us to the green room first. And we're only there for like literally like 45 seconds. Then we start beelining it to the stage, right? And we get to the stage and they just hand me a microphone. And Cube is like, you can do it. Put your ass into it. And I'm like, I'm performing with Ice Cube on the stage. Like it was just this incredible moment. Like, I'm like, damn, this is wild, right? So we finish the whole run, get back to New Orleans, and I'm thinking to myself, like, this might be the last time that I really be able to chill in the hood, right? So I'm in Holly Grove, walking down Nelson Street, going to the gas station, like, this might be the last time I get to do this shit, you know? So I'm just enjoying it. And then people start coming out of their house and shit. Motherfuckers is looking like. Now I'm getting nervous. My heart beating fast. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> this is not what's up. You know what I mean? So I get to the gas station, bro, and it's literally like 35, 40 people outside. People start coming in, and I'm like, I'm about to get robbed or fucking beat to death out here. Like, I don't know what's about to happen, but they about to definitely take what I got, right? And then people start pulling out their phones. He did it. He did it. The boy, you know what I mean? And it was like, that was the first star moment I actually had. And for it to have been in my neighborhood where I grew up and everybody was just so proud, I was like, okay, okay. You know, I might have done something, so. <laughs> yeah. That's what's up, man. Yeah. Well deserved. Well deserved. Okay, so after that film... You did some other films. Yeah. Uh, in 2016, uh, you did Keanu yep. with Key and Peele. Yeah. Uh, you also did Barry, uh, which was about Barack Obama, yep. which came out on Netflix. Yep. You appeared in the movie Detroit in 2017. And then that same year, you had the starring role in Mudbound. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess that was the first role that they actually offered you that you didn't have to audition for? Yeah, which was trippy, right? Because... um. I had no idea who D. Reeves was at the time. Actually, when I first met her, I, I mistaked her film for Ava's film. I was like, yeah, I saw Selma. She was like, that's that's not my movie. I was like, damn. <laughs> so, um, you know, I had to actually end up going back and watching her film, Pariah, but she just knew exactly what she wanted. She was like the most sure black woman I had ever met, right? But they was like, yeah, you know, this is this is going to be deep. You know, so um, I read the script and my agent is like, do you like it? I was like, I love it. And they were like, did you read it to the end? I'm like, yes, I love it. They was like, are you sure? I was like, listen, people, this is how it was, okay, for black folks growing up. Like, this is how shit really used to go. Like, at least I don't die at the end. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it, it was kind of great. But then we got on set and it was like, 
I mean, because we went on trips when, well, not trips, but uh, field trips. When I was in like the the fourth and fifth grade to these places, like the wax museums and, you know, the, the plantations and all of that. It was literally like down the street. You could almost see it from where we shot Mudbound. So like it was this eerie feeling of like, finally I'm doing something that, that means something. Because what I did with, with, with NWA was great. And it was like huge for the culture. But like as a young black man, like my grandfather's oldest brother was a slave. You know what I mean? So in three generations, we went from slavery to being able to tell that story on the big screen, which was really, really interesting and a lot for me to soak up. So um, it was it was a turning point for me in my career, like definitely for me to be like, okay, I'm about to start taking this shit serious. You know what I mean? And in my heart started feeling low key like an actor activist a little bit. You know what I mean? Like, cause I'm a visual learner. Like you can put a book in front of me all day and I won't absorb the same emotion, obviously, that you would get from from watching a movie, you know? And uh, people run into me all the time and they're like, we're watching Mudbound in schools now and it's great. And I was like, damn. So um, yeah, that, that, that changed my life right there for real. It started making me look at myself different. You know, because I, I, I kind of thought I got a little bit lucky with the Easy e situation. Like, it was it was a lot of God's work that was involved in that, you know. But um, Mudbound was uh, my duty, you know. And for me to be able to show up in that space and people be like, oh, Jason Mitchell snubbed at the Oscars because of it was like, okay, I see. Now I, f- I see where I am at the on the totem pole, you know. And, uh, yeah, that movie did great. Right. Well, you did get snubbed at the Oscars, but the Oscars did show a lot of love. Yeah, to that yeah. Movie overall, um, yeah. Uh, Mary J. Blige got nominated for Best Supporting Actress. Uh, she also got nominated uh, for Best Original Song, which made her the first uh, person to ever be nominated for both acting and songwriting yeah. in the same year. Uh, nominated for Best Adapted Screenplay uh, by Reese and Virgil Williams. Reese actually became the first African-American woman to ever be nominated for that. Yeah. And uh, Best Cinematography. Uh, Richard Morrison. Uh, another nomination. Yeah. Richard Morrison became the first woman to ever be nominated in that yeah. category. So, yeah. so, like, a lot of glass yeah. ceilings were broken with that film. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I was definitely down for, you know, because to see, like, like, they fought for a lot. They fought for a lot. But I've done, obviously, other films with other people. And for them to be so sure about what they wanted, like literally, D would shoot like maybe, I don't know, five or six takes and be like, all right, we're moving on. We got it. And you'd be like, what? And you know, after working with somebody like F. Gary Gray, who does 30 takes potentially on, you know, on, on each scene, you're like, God damn, like you sure we got it? And she just knew. She knew exactly what she wanted. And Rachel was the same way. You know what I mean? Rachel was the same way. And it got to the point where D started tweaking things like the scene with uh with me and Mary with the chocolate. She just wrote that in. We got finished early that day. That never happens. You know what I mean? And we got finished early that day. And she was like, I got this other scene that I want y'all to do. And um, we ended up just shooting that on the humbug, which was really dope in the film. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, shout out to them. They definitely was hyper-focused, you know what I mean? And they could already see the end result, which is rare in filmmakers, you know? Oscar winners, maybe, but, like, you know, they're also rare. <laughs> well, after that, you were in uh, Kong, Skull Island, yeah. which is your first kind of blockbuster film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, my homie Jordan Bo Roberts, man, that's my guy to the end, of, to the world blow up. I love that kid. But he had actually won Sundance, and Kong was his next movie, right? Now, when we did Straight Outta Compton, they gave me 20 tickets for the premiere. I slid one to him, because I was like, I'm about to use this as the biggest audition of my life, right? So I slid one to him and like a few more important people, because I couldn't fly 20 people out to come see the movie, you know what I mean, in LA. So like my immediate family came out, and then I, I slid a ticket or two, you know what I mean, to like certain people. And Jordan Bo Roberts was one of those people. So literally we go to the uh the after party, right? <laughs> 
And he walks up to me and he's like, you ready to go to Skull Island? And I'm like, hell yeah. You know what I mean? And I just had to wait for that to, to officially process. But um, I had knew for a while that, that Jordan wanted me to be in the film. So when it actually happened, I was like, yo, this is crazy. Like working with Sam Jackson and John C. Riley, John Goodman, like these are the greats. I'm like, I'm a real actor now. You know what I mean? This is, this is dope. Yeah, that, that, that took it to a whole different level. Right. And in that same year, you were in The, the Disaster Artist uh, yeah, with yeah. James Franco. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, that was a trip, man, because they were such fans of who I was. Like, my scene actually ended up getting cut. They just wanted me in the movie, so they were like, ah, just come out, check it out. Like, let's see if we can figure it out. You know what I mean? So they, like, got me a trailer and everything. And um, Seth meets me at my trailer, and he's like, bro, we're just going to go out here, and we're just going to try some shit. You know what I mean? Like, it actually didn't even end up making the movie, but the fact that they thought about me and was, like, fans of who I was was kind of great. You know what I mean? And to be able to, like, work with Dave and spitball with these guys, like, you know, we still got great relationships, which is really, really cool. But I never thought that they, they would have their eyes on me. You know what I mean? And quite as kept, like, they've been people who I've been fans of, like, for their entire career, pretty much. And I don't know how other people are with actors and how they feel about movies, but me, I I like, I like was picking my friends and the people who I would hang out with, like, you know, as I watched them on TV and before I ever got famous. So I always felt like me, Seth Rogen, and James Franco was going to be friends anyway. You know what I mean? So when I met these guys and it was like so much love, it was dope, you know? And um, Franco ended up inviting me to this, like, this uh this very intimate dinner and like the biggest actors ever were there. You know what I mean? Like Tom Hanks, Timothy Chalmette, like uh guy who plays Thor. Like everybody was like the the juggernauts were at this table, right? And um I had this other engagement to go to, so I was like, I don't want everybody to give a speech and I hope I don't start like a rally with this, but it's almost incredible that I'm at this table. You know what I mean? And I like, I, I forgot everything I said, but like, it literally started like everybody giving a speech. You know what I mean? So exactly what I did want to happen, like it, it made people started standing up one by one, like giving speeches. You know what I mean? Like Daniel Kalula was there, um, a, a bunch of guys. You know what I mean? Like all the juggernauts of the acting world that you see today were in that room. And it was, it was really, really dope to have that, um, that male embrace, you know, because it was all men. So um, to have that male embrace from from my peers was just really, really, really cool, you know. And um, I met Tom Hanks that night, and I was like, you know, it's crazy. Like, some people tell me that I'm the black version of you. And he was like, are you kidding? I'm the white version of you. Like, And I was <laughs> like, damn, Tom Hanks knows who I am. Like, that that blew my mind, bro. Because he's, he's one of the greats for sure. Well, that same year... You were flying on Delta Airlines, yeah. and things went kind of left. Yeah, man. Um, I paid nine thousand dollars for a ticket. Like Showtime surprised me with some boxing tickets because they know I'm like a huge Floyd Mayweather fan. Like people ask me all the time, like if you can play anybody in a movie, who would it be? And I'm like Floyd. You know what I mean for sure? Because I think it would push me physically, mentally, and obviously my acting skills would have to. You know what I mean? I would be showing just this different face. So um, Showtime surprises me with these tickets. And they're like, all you got to do is get yourself there and back. So I'm like, okay. So um, I'm making my way back. Mind you, paid $9,000 for this ticket. And they're like, yeah, um, they give me this different boarding pass, right? Because my boarding pass is on my phone. So after they scanned it, I'm supposed to be sitting in first class. And then they're like, they put me in the back somewhere, right? So I've been double booked before and like I've experienced all of that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? So I know already that like once I get on the ground, wherever I'm going, then it's going to be like your word versus my word. And this is $9,000 for a ticket. You know what I mean? Like this is ridiculous. Like this is some shit that I was afraid to tell my mom. Like I spent $9,000 on a ticket. You know what I mean? Because who does that? Like I said, that's a, it's a used car, you know? So, um... They they just, I really felt ignored, 
You know what I mean? And I felt like, like, what do you mean? Like, we need to figure this out now. You know what I mean? And I got upset. And to be honest, like, if I could, if I could take back my response, I would. But in the moment, I felt like I had to stand for something. You know what I mean? I, it was like a Rosa Parks moment in real life. Like, what's happening right now? Why is it not at all urgent to you guys that I'm a paying customer that spent 9000 on a ticket and you feel like you can just sit me in the back and not explain anything to me or give me any points or any, any nothing? You're not going to say anything to me? They really wouldn't even look me in my face, which it, and it, and it hurt at the time because it was like, you might as well just say, look, nigga, sit down. You know what I mean? Because that's, that's basically what was happening without the words. You know what I mean? And it, it, it hurt. It hurt in the moment. You know what I mean? And I also was hurt by the fact that, because what they don't show in, in the video that's out, right, is that um, they told everybody to, to get off the plane. And I was like, why would you have everybody get off the plane? Like, that's that's ridiculous. You know what I mean? Like, I can get off and it is what it is. But that was the point that I got emotional because now I'm the guy who's on the shy, who's number one on the call sheet, who's late from Vegas. So now I'm pissed because I'm embarrassed on the inside. So it's not just my money, but now I'm embarrassed that I'm about to be coming back from Vegas late. Like, you know what I mean? Like, as black young black guys, we don't get chances like that. You know, so I feel like, you know, I was I was blowing my chance. You know what I mean? And it just it hurt. It stung so bad in my chest that like I just I couldn't hold it. I couldn't hold it. You know, in moments I, I wish I might have reacted differently because what I've learned is that you can only control your actions. What other people do is what they do. And you can't control that, you know, but I, I, I definitely could have controlled myself at that moment, but I, I just felt like as a young black man, I had to stand for something. Like, hell no, nah, y'all not going to do this to me today. Well, didn't you actually do a Delta commercial around that time? Yeah, I just did a Delta commercial for them. I was trying to, I was trying <laughs> not to be the guy to be like, do you know who I am? Like, I was trying <laughs> not to be that person. You know what I mean? Like, I, I was trying to be very professional about it at first, but of course, none of that ever makes TMZ. You know what I mean? But it was, it was just weird to me that I was like, yo, I just did this commercial with you guys. And in quiet is kept, like, we were represented by the same agency, you know? And I've never ever, before that day, I had never ever flown with anybody else in my life. Because like I said, my parents were in the military and the military has a thing with Delta, you know? So since I was, I don't know, maybe two or three years old, I've been taking Delta flights. I'm like a platinum customer and all of this other stuff, you know? So for them to not treat me as so, it it like, it hurt a little bit. You know what I mean? Because what, just because I'm a young black dude don't mean I'm not a platinum customer? Like, you know? And it, I was like, damn. that Yeah, it bothered me. It, it was some foolishness. I assume there's no more Delta commercials after that. <laughs> <laughs> that would be safe I think to that say. That was pretty much the end of your working relationship with, yeah, with Delta. It would be safe to say that you ain't going to see me on no more of them flights. <laughs> okay, okay. So that next year, 2018, uh, you were in the Mustang, which yeah. actually I just, I just saw. Dope oh, really? movie. Did yeah, you it's, like it's, it? a pri- it's, a, it's a prison movie, essentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I you feel know, the like focus honestly, on horses it was some and, of and my everything best else like acting that. because I was afraid of horses my whole huh. life, and uh, I actually broke a foot as well on that movie. And it was like I just toughed it out, man. I was with a bunch of really good guys, really good wranglers, and yeah, I had a I had a great time making that movie actually. And in that same year, Superfly came out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shout out to Trevor Jackson, man, and Director X and. Lex Scott Davis, who who uh, played Georgia in that film, like that was a big moment for her and myself because she was actually an extra in Straight Outta Compton. Is how me and Lex met, so that was like a full circle moment for us, which was really really cool. But yeah, Superfly was dope, man. Superfly was it was an interesting film to make. It was like collaborative on a different sort of level, you know, because at first. You know, because when you watch the first Superfly, they got like this random seven minute music video in the middle. And we like, how are we going to exactly work this out? You know, it was X's first big blockbuster. 
So we didn't know what to expect at first, you know. Uh, uh, originally, they uh, they offered me priest, and I was like, "What? Have you seen Superfly? Have you seen me? Like, no, this isn't gonna work," you know. So um, yeah, we went back and forth a bunch of times, man. But yeah, shout out to that whole crew, Joe Silver. You know, he did he did the Matrix, you know, mm. which was the last movie me and my dad saw. So I forever yeah. appreciate that guy. Okay, and I think that same year is when you started filming for The Shy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great series, by the way. I've watched that series from day one, watched every episode. Um, you know, Iman Shumpert's been on my show a few times. You know, he's had he's had a role in the last couple seasons. Um, but what's interesting about the process of you guys filming this was was this. On October 29th, 2018, the rapper Young Greatness got killed. And this was a close friend of yours. Now, we actually did an interview with the Young Greatness. I don't know if you ever saw it. Yeah, I saw, well, I saw pieces of it. I, didn't, I hadn't watched the entire interview, but I have seen pieces of it, yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't do the interview myself, but it was, a, it was a Vlad TV interview. And one of the questions that came up in the interview was, does he ever worry about going back to his home city of New Orleans? You know where you go at is gonna be some drama. It's gonna be hate, but it ain't gonna be no hate like you know the the city where you're from. Mm -hmm. You know I'm faced with it every day. You know what I'm saying you just had to you know I just keep on moving. I just keep working. I give some more some more stuff to hate about. I'm just being real with you. Yeah. You know I don't really give a fuck about that. You know they're gonna talk. They're gonna say whatever they want to say. You know what I'm saying? You know, you just have to keep the real genuine people around you and keep some savages around you because if they get on some savage shit, you just got to be ready to get back on some savage shit with them. You know what I'm saying? I just was raised like that. You shouldn't feel no man but God. And you know what I'm saying? I'm not letting nobody, you know, run me from, you know, my, you know, my family. And my family's in New Orleans. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not, I'm not a dummy and, you know, I'm not ignorant. But if I have to go see my kids, and I have to go see my auntie, or I have to go see my grandmother or my mother, that's what I'm going to do. I don't care what, who's saying what or who's saying they're going to do what. Well, I'm going to have to die going out brave. And that's just what it is. Two years later, he was actually killed in New Orleans. Yeah. Um... How close were you guys? You know, me and uh, me and Greatness were very close. You know what I mean? I was close enough to him to call him Teddy. You know, um, my cousin used to make beats, and uh, at the time we were like both youngins, just in the studio. You know, just kind of sitting back watching. And it was before either of us really like tried to do anything special with our life and rapping or whatever. We was just kind of like influenced by the trap, but we knew that like music was a great outlet, you know? And um our careers sort of like uh mirrored each other, you know? And um it was just good to have somebody who uh who could graduate with me out of that space, you know, because you gotta separate yourself from that space so much and everything you knew and, you know, the way you came up and the way you were trained, you got to like un unlearn all of that stuff, you know, and uh, and be able to move out of that space, you know? So um, to have somebody who, uh, who could do that with me was very special. So it wasn't just about me and him being friends, but me and him also being able to take a step that did a lot for the generation that we came from, from our city, you know? Yeah. Um. Yeah, so, um, I don't, I, I mean, I still don't know how to feel, you know what I mean? Because it's like, what the fuck, you know? Does nobody have respect enough to say, hey, this is where we came from and this is where we deserve to be? You know what I mean? Like, is is it really that much hate where you can't let the man make it home to see his kids? Like, it wasn't even probably nothing, nothing serious. You know what I mean? It was probably some bullshit. Like, 
he was only 34 years old. He was killed outside of a Waffle House uh, at Elysian Field Avenue in New Orleans. Was that case ever solved? Were, were the people that did him that, that did it ever arrested and convicted? Or I don't know. I don't even know. You know, because I don't know. It's a lot to accept. Yeah, I'm sorry for your loss, man. Appreciate that. Shout out to well, your greatness, man. Shout out to the whole family. Yeah. We're going to keep it moving for him. Well, the reason I mentioned this was because this happened on the same day that you were filming for right. The Shy. Right. And Ayano Floyd David, who oh. I guess was a showrunner on the show, yeah. Yeah. saw that you were upset and spoke to you that day. Right. 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 Tell me about that conversation. Um, She came to me and asked me... uh. If if I was okay, you know, and I don't know if it, you know, like for those who watch the shy, right? Like my character Brandon could never really catch a break, you know. But I have this ability to um to be able to go through really tough scenes and then be laughing in the next room. You know what I mean? It's almost like this this therapy that I have going on. But on this day in particular. I just couldn't shake it, you know? Like, even in between takes, like, the tears were still coming and all of that stuff. Like, I was just, I was a mess, you know? Because that had happened late that night, and then when I woke up the next day, I found out, you know what I mean? And I had to go to work with that on my mind. And everybody knew, so she comes to me and she's like, you know, are you okay? And I'm just like, no, I'm just shaking my head, no, like, I'm not. And um, as I'm coming past Video Village, she says in front of everybody, like, yo, I I know, you know, that, that your friend just got killed and, you know, we just don't want you to go home and self-medicate. And I was like, what? That was weird. You know what I mean? Because, like, I, I felt like, I don't know, I had she had never seen me under the influence of drugs or alcohol or anything like that. So I was like, this was just a really odd statement to make. But instead of saying anything, you know, I just, I, I called Lena and uh, I told her about it, you know what I mean? And I was like, I don't, like, I feel like somebody other than her needs to have, well, other than me needs to have a conversation with her because I felt super offended, you know what I mean? And I was like, why Why would you do or say anything like that to me, you know? And, um, yeah, as a, as a result, it ended up turning into something, like, completely different, you know? And uh, Ayana kind of thought that I had a... Um, a personal vendetta against her and ended up taking that to the authorities, but I didn't, you know what I mean? And the thing about HR situations is that like, you're never going to know the source. You're never going to know the real story because when they do an investigation, like literally one of the rules is not to talk about it. You can't talk about it with anybody. So, you know, I don't, I don't know if it was Lena or, you know, somebody Lena might've told that went to uh, HR and had this conversation about, you know, what Ayana had said to me. But as a result, Ayana came back to me with with um with a lot of bass in her voice, you know what I mean? And it was it was a conversation that sort of got heated because in her mind she thinking I snitched on her, you know what I mean? But I'm like, you know my background better than that. Like I ain't I ain't got that even in my blood, you know, but as a result, she ended up getting fired for that. And uh yeah. And I can only imagine that, you know, she might have felt like me and Lena conspired to get her fired or some bullshit. I don't know. But um, she kind of brought that on herself. I didn't really have nothing to do with that. I can't fire you. I don't even have that kind of yank. You know what I mean? Like, that's that's all above my head. So, you know, it's kind of an unfortunate situation. You know, we see this with in the black community all the time, that people just can't keep it professional and just work together or talk through their problems or whatever it may be. You know, you see a lot of this bickering going back and forth and it just, it, it was just an unfortunate situation because at the end of the day, we all ended up losing. Right, well, let me make sure I have the timeline right of, mm -hmm. of what exactly happened. So so that happened, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I think you, you went to HR to talk about it or, or no? I didn't, I didn't. You didn't. Okay, so Lena, Lena went to HR to talk about it mm -hmm. 
And Ayana ended up getting fired over that situation. Well, after Ayana found out that she was under investigation, I guess she just assumed I did it. So she came uh -huh. to me and was like, Jason, you could have fucking told me that you were going to go to HR. And like, I was like, what? Like, I didn't, I didn't go to HR. But that, that got back to HR that she came uh -huh. back to me and it was like, you know, it's some sort of no retaliation thing. I forget exactly what, what it's called, but basically it's like retaliation, you know, and she came back to me with this attitude and that ultimately got her fired. Okay, so so that happens on The Shy. Mm -hmm. And not too long after, you were in the process of filming Desperados uh -huh. uh, for Netflix. Right, right. And a situation happened with a co-star of yours. right. Can you talk about that? Um, well, a young lady uh, that, you know, was, was part of the cast, she ended up getting drunk, and I had her call her boyfriend to, like, make sure she got home safely. And I think that he was under the impression that um, that she liked me, or, you know, like, he was really upset that she was out, you know, with me at the time. And, uh, you know, as much as I stressed to him, like, bro, I'm just trying to do, you know, what a good friend does, he actually uh, took it upon himself to report me to HR. And at the time, I, I, I didn't understand the concept of somebody who didn't work with us being able to um, report me to my job. I, I didn't even understand that concept, right? So, um. You know, like I said, we had called him before, so I had his number. So I called him and I was like, you know, I was I was upset. You know what I mean? I, I was really upset that he felt like, I don't know if he felt like I was lying to him or if we was lying to him or his girl was trying to cheat. I don't know what he was thinking, but I felt like he knew for a fact that I did the right thing as a friend on that day. Like, why why would you try to create turmoil for this, right? And then, like, 15 minutes later, my agent calls me, and he's like, Jason, you're just making it worse. And I was like, making what worse? This guy doesn't even work with us. How am I about to get fired from a job that, you know what I'm saying? Like, to me, th the concept just didn't make sense. I couldn't grasp it. And it just made me so fucking upset, man. I was like, what is happening to me right now? Like, you know what I mean? Just because it's it's, it's this white guy telling you that I... I was with his girlfriend while she was drunk. Now all of a sudden it's a problem. Like he doesn't even work with us. You know what I mean? Like what's happening right now? This is just her boyfriend, you know? And, um, you know, uh, as a result, they were just like, yo, we're not going to, you know, we're never going to blame anything on you or say this or that. But at this point, you know, um, we think you should just go your separate way. You know, we'll still pay you. We'll do all of that. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll see you on the next project, you know, but no, no press is going to come out about this. Like they ensured me that everything would be cool. Right. So, um, Ayanna Floyd Davis gets wind of this situation and decides to take it upon herself to just make up a story. You know, everything that she said was false and I stand on it in court. You know what I mean? Everybody around her. Her and everybody who was on the shy knows that what she said was completely false. But she wanted to make me and Lena look bad. But um, unfortunately for me, you know, I'm the one who took the bullet. You know what I mean? So it, it is what it is, you know. But I really think that she wanted both me and Lena to lose where we were. Because, I mean, let's be honest, like, she probably hasn't worked since then. Like, I don't know. I, I don't Google her. And I don't, I don't wish no bad on her. But I'm more than sure that she that people don't want her around because she caused problems, you know? Well, right. I, I guess around that time, Disney bought Showtime. Right, 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 right. Right. So once, you know, the Desperados situation happened and then, you know, Ayana brought back these allegations, then suddenly you were, had a whole new investigation about you. Right. And now... It's happening in your other show, The Shy. Right, right. And and now it's, you know, and I, I guess I guess the part I don't quite understand is that when you look it up, it's 
sexual misconduct allegations. Who right. from everything that I've seen you talk about, there was no sexual misconduct. It right. was some arguments or whatever else, but right. there was no sexual part to it. Right. You know what's crazy, right? It's because like I don't read the media. Rather it be good or bad. I, I just don't because I feel like I need to stay level headed. And you know, I've met some actors who in my opinion, have become assholes because they're, they're getting big-headed because of what people have said about them. So whether it's good or bad, I don't read the media, right? But, um, you know, I remember my publicist calling me saying, you know, they're saying it's just some allegations, but there's nothing sexual involved, right? And I was like, all right, well, I guess I can handle that because, I mean, it is what it is because at the end of the day, you know, if, if you look... I mean, the only thing that you're going to find to actually know the real Jason Mitchell may potentially be this this situation that happened with Delta, right? Which was, you know, something, like I said, I really, really wish I could take back, but I was so hurt in that moment that I got emotional. So, you know, they're going to say, okay, Jason is is an aggressive guy, and, and this is why, because of this video that happened. You know, but at the end of the day, bro, at the beginning of the day, like, I'm a daughter of two. I mean, I'm not a daughter of two. I have two daughters. I have a beautiful mother. I have a sister who played a lot in raising me. Like, as you know, my dad killed himself when I was 15. So all I know is is women and how to respect women and what I want for my daughters and all of that. So to see the media go from just misconduct to sexual allegations without anybody knowing the story or anybody making a statement. Like, it really hurt. Like, you know what I mean? And then you got this publicist who's on side of you saying, just be quiet. Just be quiet. Just keep quiet about everything. Because, you know, on the day, I'm thinking, nah, like, let's let's talk about this. Let's put the real story out there. Because, you know, I could I could take responsibility and and I can be held accountable for what I did, but I didn't do that. You know what I mean? And I've I've constantly heard story after story after story. And I'm like, this is getting kind of crazy. You know what I mean? And I, I just, I, I felt helpless for a minute. Like, I didn't know what to do. But all I could do was count on my moments with people and my actual, you know, personal Jason Mitchell experiences with people to outweigh that. Because anybody who has been in the room with me or anybody who has ever been around me know. You know what I mean? Maybe, you know, if 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 I if I did something or made somebody feel some kind of way, because at the end of the day, I am from New Orleans. You know what I mean? So if I ever did something or said something to somebody to make them uncomfortable, like I definitely apologize for that. But as far as like sexually harassing somebody or whatever the story is out there that they're saying, I'm just not that person. And I just it, it really bothers me that the media would try to paint me as a monster, you know what I mean? Because I'm definitely not that. Like, that's that's not who I am. I mean, it's a rough position for a man to be in in the entertainment industry. You know, for example, I just interviewed Neil deGrasse Tyson. Okay. Who had his own Me Too mo- you know, moment right. where a woman said that he spoke inappropriately to her 30 years ago. Right. You know, and, and after going through the whole investigation, they found that there was nothing there and he got to go back to his life, but that doesn't always happen. Right. Um, you know, you said something interesting. You said, I'm I'm all for the Me Too movement, but I think in this situation, Ayanna Floyd Davis tried to use it as a really, really ugly weapon. Yeah, she definitely did weaponize the whole situation because at that point, it was like a witch hunt. You know what I mean? Me Too is at the height of everything, you know, like, because they, let's be honest, like, they do have some monsters out here. You know what I mean? They have people who um who use their, their position as leverage. You know, yeah. but... Harvey I, Weinstein, for example. Exactly, Harvey Weinstein. Who's, who's, a, who's convicted, who's in prison right now. Exactly. Because- you know what I mean? For me, nobody even ever came out and had a story. The police were never involved. You know, and, like, a part of me thought, I guess, the, the public would have... um would have would have used their their common sense and been like, hey, well, you know, if the police didn't get out or if if no female ever came out and made a statement against them or whatever, that it would kind of just go away. You know, but um it wasn't like that. Like it was tough. You know what I mean? I still um 
I still feel like I'm in the in in this negative shade sometimes or with this dark cloud. But I'm like, you know what? I'm not gonna let that jade me or take me away from you know the space I feel like I should be in because I feel like I definitely deserve to be here. Like God gave me a great gift and and I deserve to be in this space. You know what I mean? Like, did I make a mistake? Yes, but who's perfect? You know, if you haven't made a mistake, put your hands up. You ain't gonna see no hands. You know. <laughs> Well, yeah, because because of this whole situation, you end up getting let go after the second season right. of The Shy. They actually yeah. killed off your character. Yeah, yeah, which was crazy. Like When you were told they're going to kill off your character, and not only are you getting fired, but you actually have to participate in the event of the firing by acting out your demise. Like, Well, actually, you... what's crazy about it is that they didn't even bring me back to act out my demise. They just put like a closed casket. And a picture of me on top of it. No oh, yeah, explanation. Right. Oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah, yeah it was it, it yeah. was pretty crazy, you know? And they, like, it, to me, it was just so strange. Like, it, I don't know. It was just it was just so strange, you know? But the part that I think hurt me the most about it is that when I first met Ayanna Floyd Davis, she was, like, trying to stress to me that, like, I love to see my young black brothers win. I would do anything for you. You know, and now that I look back on it, I'm just like, hmm. Hmm. Mm. You know? Yeah. Because not only did you get let go after the second season of The Shy, you got dropped by United Talent Agency and Authentic Talent and Literary Management. Uh, your MTV Movie and TV Awards got revoked, which is yeah. kind of silly. But yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I guess yeah. that's that's when the pylon starts to happen. Everyone wants to have the little... You know, that little kick in when you're down. Right, right, right. Exactly. And it's so crazy because I think that everybody thought something was going to happen. Like, everybody thought some kind of charges were going to come up. Or everybody thought that, um, you know, something big was going to happen after it. You know? So I just got let go by everybody. But in turn, it just made me look bad. You know what I mean? That, that was really just it. There was nothing that came from it or nothing like that because... I, I don't know. I don't know if they thought that I, I'd lie to them about something or that I wasn't being truthful about something. But I'm like, nah. I mean, I might have reacted in a way that I shouldn't have, but I I didn't do anything to anybody. And they're like, Jason, we want to believe you, but I'm like, what? This is this is all very strange, you know. But that's when I found out that I was very much expendable to them, and I had to um, regroup. And not only work with who wanted to work with me, but like learn how to invest in myself, you know, which became a, a superpower. You know what I mean? I met a, a guy by the name of Jaquavis Coleman, who is a, a super good friend of mine, but um, supported me emotionally when I felt like I didn't know what to do. You know, they had so many people who turned their back on me who who was there while everything was good, you know, but... um. He started telling me, like, bro, you you a hell of a talent. You know what I mean? And like, if if you want to invest in yourself, like, I'll invest with you. And this is how everything is both actually became a thing. You know what I mean? Because everything sort of got quiet during COVID anyway. You know, like I, I ended up booking this other job. Um it was this is a film called Fifty Shots about the kid Sean Bell, but um, the director, his mom ended up dying of COVID. Like it was just this crazy situation. So it tore the whole, um, it tore the whole film apart, you know? And I just had this time on my hands, right? And Jaquavis is in my ear like, bro, just invest in yourself. Let's, let's take our money and let's shoot a movie. You know what I mean? So I took everything I had and put it into a film. And um, yeah, yeah. It's it's gonna be dope. It's gonna be dope. It's dropping June second. We're gonna be on Apple TV, you know. And uh, oh, it was so you got a you got a movie on Apple TV. Yeah, which, uh, honestly, I'm gonna say quality wise, I'll put Apple TV at the very top. Oh, like, what they what what they put out. I mean, HBO Max would probably be second after that, right? But consistency with Apple TV is on a different level. Yeah, absolutely. Apple TV don't even accept any everything. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you, you can send it and they gonna send it right back. You know what I mean? <laughs> but um, 
But yeah, man, to be able to um have done that by ourselves and land on Apple TV, like this, that was our first at bat. You know what I mean? So like now I'm in this place where I'm like, you know, as as Hollywood and the studios warm back up to me, I'm I'm in this different place now where not only do I understand the business part of show business, but I've I've also, you know, did a lot of learning and growing myself because like as you can see, like, you know, nobody pulls out the book and says, okay, now that you're famous, this is how the next 10 years of your life going to go. And being from the hood, you definitely don't have those skills. You know, I'm in this huge culture shock Why I leave New Orleans and go to L.A. where everybody's pretending to be my friend and, and really are, are telling me nothing that has any value or substance. And as mm. soon as shit hits the fan, they're gone. Yeah. You know, so um, I, I I thank God, man, for for guys like Jaquavis Coleman. You know, because they he taught me a lot. He taught me a lot just about investing in myself and about uh, what that could mean for me and, and not only for the community but for my pockets. <laughs> you know what I mean? Things are a lot different when you're sitting in the production chairs. Well, uh, Lena Waithe said that she won't work with you again. And you said that actually hurt your soul when you heard that. Yeah, but then she took that back and ah, said okay. that. Yeah, so she, yeah, she took that back. You know what I mean? And um, it's it's kind of crazy. Like the whole Lena situation, I feel like, you know, she might have got scared. You know what I mean? Like I told you, it was it was a witch hunt at the time. And um, Ayanna Floyd Davis kind of wanted both of us to fail. So I think in so many ways she she might have got scared and wanted to detach herself from the situation because if Lena loses, everybody from the shy loses. Mm, you know? Yeah. Everybody from anything that she's developing loses. So, you know, if 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 I could take it back, I wouldn't. Like, you know, as far as the whole drama, like, yeah, I would, you know, like that could have went different, but as far as um if I had to choose to stand in front of the bullet to make sure Lena was protected, I'd still do it today. Wow. You know, That's what's up. at the end of the day, like, you know, we talking about, like, what about Alex Hibbert? You know, what about little Michael Epps? What about Shaman Brown? What about Jacob Lattimore? What about Hannah Hall? What about all of these people who have busted ass to get to this point? You know what I mean? Like, if, if all that gets shut down, then what? Like, nah, I take that on the chin, you know? I ain't going to die. Well, when you look at what happened to you and you look at what's happening with Jonathan Majors, who arguably is the hottest actor in Hollywood right now. Right, right, right. I, I mean, like, as someone on a trajectory, I mean, he's now Kang the Conqueror and Marvel mm -hmm. and getting leading roles and everything else like that. And suddenly, one one bad night with his girlfriend everything changed. I mean, in fact, everyone's sort of waiting to see what Disney's going to do. There's rumors that Disney actually might recast him for Kang, which yeah. would be devastating. Absolutely devastating. You know, you know, I'm not saying the situation is the same between you guys, yeah. but there are similarities in terms of at a high level. When you look at that situation, what do you think? I think that, like, it's sad that we don't have a support system that helps us develop as men as we develop as stars because they don't care about you at all. You know what I mean? There's there, Hollywood does not care about you. You can't call them and say, hey, I'm having a bad night. You know, I'm, I'm scared that, you know, my girlfriend may do this or do that or I'm scared that, you know, people are around me and, and this is the wrong influence. Like, they don't care about any of that. There's no soft skills training. There's no, there's no grooming to, to the back end of becoming a star. But you have to go live your real life the majority of that time. And I just think that it's, it's, it's very scary that, like, when you're at the height of everything, you're such a target and people don't think it's imperative that a wall is built around you because it is, you know, your, your agency isn't going to sit you down and say, you need to leave the Hollywood parties alone. Make sure you're not around any drug addicts. Make sure you're not in the car with any bullshit. 
Make sure you stay away from these females. They're not going to have this talk with you. You know what I mean? And then the female who you've been knowing since you were 15 years old now can't handle where you are in life. And the first thing that they can think is, let me bring you down. Because it's the easiest thing for them to go to. It's the easiest adjustment for them to make. It's for them to bring you back down to their level. And I just feel like, you know, it's it's just such a, a, a tragedy. You know what I mean? Because, like, when Jonathan Majors won, we all won. When Michael B. Jordan win, we all win. You know, and it's like we all lose when things like that happen. So I don't understand why after all these things that we've seen happen and go wrong, that we're not having these sidebar conversations that ultimately is building this wall around people. You know what I mean? Like when when that situation happened with Will Smith and Chris Rock, the way Denzel and those other guys came and put that wall around him for a minute and talk to him and like, hey, you know what I mean? True enough, they was a little bit late, you know what I mean? <laughs> but like, you know, in essence, like that's what should really be happening. We should be protecting our own instead of getting out there and say, you know what he should have did? Blah, 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 blah. You know what this happened? Blah, 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 blah. He shouldn't have been messing with a, a white girl. He shouldn't, like, to me, that was just so sad to see. You know what I mean? Like, I reached out to him and I just sent my love. You know what I mean? Because that's all you could do. Like, who knows what that's like? You think? Oh, you guys, you, you and Jonathan Majors know each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, have you guys talked since that happened? No. Okay. I you just sent him a text, text and said, "Okay, you, yeah, you're going and I backed right off because I can only that. imagine, yeah. like, like who wants to talk about it? You know what I mean? Like, what are you going to call yeah. and say? So, tell me what happened. Like, not, you know, <laughs> he's probably paranoid. Like. You yeah. know, like, doesn't feel like he can trust anybody. And that's what this will do to you. Like, it'll jade you super hard. You know what I mean? And it'll have you feeling very um, reclusive. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, that's all you can really do is is just tuck your tail after that. You know what I mean? Because there's nobody here to, to, to say anything great on your behalf. Because the industry might potentially cut them off. You know, I remember yeah. having a conversation with Issa Rae where she was like, man, this industry is so fucked up that, like, the people who really want to work with you can't even work with you. Because not eat. You know what I mean? This is probably why Lena Waite jumped out and was like, oh, we will never work with him again. You know, even though she didn't even mean that. You know what I mean? She she called me crying about that. I'll take it back, Jason. I'm so sorry. I just didn't know. Like, we we don't know. I wasn't on set. I don't know. I don't know what happened. And I'm like. You know, it is what it is, but it's so sad to see some of this stuff, man. It's it's really sad. I'm just glad that, you know, I got close enough to feel how hot the fire was without being burned. That way I could not only make adjustments in my own life, but, you know, as people come in through through my program and, you know, people that, that we work with, I could constantly mentor them and give them those soft skills and make sure that wall is built around them. Like I'm, I'm just starting with myself, bro, you know, staying positive and just being the man that I wish was my friend when I was going through all of this, you know? So just taking it one day at a time. Well, there was more drama with the show after you left, uh, Barton Fitzpatrick, he ended up leaving the show. Uh, yeah. The rumor was, was because, you know, the storyline moved into him having a relationship with a trans uh, actress. And then later on, you know, Jasmine Davis, the same uh, trans actress, had her own <laughs> drama with the show. Uh, I guess she left the show because she had, I guess, tried to fake her vaccine record. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then she ended up tweeting, said she had to leave because it was a very toxic environment. But, you yeah. know, I don't know if you still watch the show, but she's not on the show anymore. She just disappeared I and actually, they're like, oh, we don't know what happened to her. And Yeah, I actually you know. don't watch any of my stuff. You know what I mean? So, I, you know, I obviously really wasn't watching it after after I ended up leaving. Because to me, I'm like watching it as I'm shooting it. You know what I mean? When we have the table reads, like that's the time that I, I watch it and find out. Like me watching myself on TV is super weird and hear my voice i'm like oh my god like I, I i look and sound so much different to myself you know what i mean yeah. so no, um I, I feel you I, I gotta deal with the same thing hearing my <laughs> voice all the time was like 
<laughs> yeah, it's super weird, you know. So, um, yeah. yeah, but I mean, the environment itself, uh, I I can't really speak on it, man. I I really can't. Like, you know, I we tried to keep a um a cool, peaceful environment, you know, while we were there. But I can only imagine, you know, after I left, that things got a little bit rocky because everybody had feelings about it. You know what I mean? They knew the story that was out wasn't true. So I can only imagine, you know, that that there was a lot of feelings and a lot of high stress happening and people just didn't know how to feel. You know, the fans was reacting all crazy. So, you know, but I'm not going to lie. You can ask anybody who worked on that set. They could tell you from day one, I always said it would go seven seasons. I would literally get on the van every day and be like, seven seasons, baby, y'all know what's up. Like, you know, because I just bring this energy to everything that I do and, and, and I try to put a smile on everybody's face. So literally by the end of season one, I had everybody say seven seasons every time they see me. So, you know, hopefully they at least get that. You know what I mean? Because a lot of them people, man, I still view as family, you know? It's a great show. I still watch it. Like yeah. I said, you know, Iman Shumpert has been on my show talking about his role in it. Uh, I believe he's in the next season as well. Uh, it, it tackles some very crazy topics, like, you know, how uh, one of the characters got kidnapped and impregnated. And, you know, there's, yeah, there's, a, I mean, it's a great show. It, it's, a, it's a great show. And I hope it does go seven seasons. Yeah, man. I need you know, to, and, I need and you had a very important role in the now first. I'm, now you know? I'm intrigued. <laughs> yeah. There you go. There you go. Well, that next year, 2020, a situation happened uh, on April 22nd where you were arrested. Yeah, it was it was kind of unfortunate. You know what I mean? I, um, I was on my way to New Orleans to see family. You know what I mean? And I just kind of jumped in the car with, with the wrong people. And it was what it was. You know what I mean? It was one of those things where, like, when you got a name and you the headline... Like, I think one of the, the the cops, like, tweeted, like, and that's how it got out. You know what I mean? <laughs> I was like, this is, this is crazy. You know what I mean? But all of those charges have been dropped, like, fully dismissed. I'm not dealing with any of that anymore. But it was just kind of unfortunate and embarrassing at the time to deal with. But, uh, yeah, it was what it was. Right, because the headlines are insane. Uh, it said that you were pulled over in an SUV. It didn't really mention other people. It was right. almost like it was almost like you're by yourself, which isn't true. But right. based on the reports that you know, Jason Mitchell was pulled over with two pounds of marijuana, thirteen hundred doses of ecstasy, an AK forty seven, a Glock right. nine millimeter pistol with the extendo clip. Right, <laughs> exactly. I'm like, like oh, is this where like, was what type he of headed? You know shit what are you on like, right now? Like, yeah, it was crazy. You know what I mean? And it was just one of those things where I was like. Ah, here we go again. You know what I mean? But like, again, man, taught me a really, really powerful lesson. Like you have to know how to move around. You know what I mean? Rather it be friends, family, whoever. Like you just can't be in the same environment. You got to think different and move different and all of that. Because when the time comes, they want you. They going to point you out. They ain't going to say, oh, he was with this one and that one and Oh, uh, you know, they're not going to say none of that. Like, they're just going to put your ass on blast. <laughs> well, right, because that happened two years before, right? You were in the Monte Carlo, they got pulled over, and now you're in jail, can't go to your movie premiere because right. of your friends, the right. people you're affiliating yourself with. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, from, from the beginning of this whole walk, you know what I mean? I have uh, been trying to separate myself from the demon that constantly drags down young black men, especially from the hood. You know what I mean? And like, you think you're not vulnerable, but you are, you know? And uh, we've lost a lot of greats like that. You know what I mean? That's how I lost young greatness. Somebody who just couldn't take it no more. Like you could, can't stand to see this man with a nice watch and a nice car and a nice, Nice career and a nice chain. Like, you just can't stand it, you know? Yeah, Bo Boosie calls it uh, hypnotized with hatred. Exactly. Exactly. A lot of people are definitely in, in, this, in this place where, like, the envy is built so much because we all started on the same playground. So how did he end up there? What did he have that I didn't have, you know? 
and and when you in a lot of these um, environments that are poverty stricken and ain't no money involved, really, it turns into a thing like may the biggest gun win or may the toughest guy win. So it, it becomes less about, you know, you pushing forward, but more about the pieces that you can take off the board. You know, like these killers are glorified these days. And it's 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 a scary thing, you know, and it, it, it hurts because you want like everybody's dream is for them to make it and get the family out the hood. But when the family can't handle it, when the friends can't handle it, when when everybody changes, they like, oh, money changed you. Like, actually, all of y'all changed. You know what I mean? Like, I always had this special thing in me. And it was cool when we was all broke. When we was all sitting in the studio together, it was cool. Let's, we all, when we all banging the mixtape in the neighborhood. But as soon as you, you get signed to QC, or as soon as you do straight out of Compton, it's a whole different thing now. Like, those people who were once your friends and who still are your family but don't know how to accept you anymore, you know? And you start to get this gap in between you and them. And in their mind, you should be doing everything possible to close that gap, mm, i.e. Yeah. giving them money, giving them cars, giving them clothes, giving them opportunities. When they're not, they're not even getting off their ass enough to learn and grow with you. You know what I mean? And it's crazy because it's like, I mean, they probably got a handful of people who believed in me at, at the beginning of all of this. And then when everything blew up, all of these people ran back. And then as soon as shit hits the fan, all of those people leave again and you back to that handful. Yeah. You know, so it's 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 it's, it's sad, man. But you it's the same, same, same day under the sun, man. You know, it just never changes. When you look at, for example, the John Morant situation. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. He pulled out the gun in the strip club. He ended up losing like thirty nine million dollars, essentially, over over that fiasco. Only for two months later, to essentially do the same thing. Right. But when you talk about friends and affiliates, right? And you know, there's a debate over whose fault it is. I mean, clearly it's Jaws' fault because he pulled out his own gun. But his friend, who's sitting there facetiming, I mean, not facetiming, going on IG live in the car with a person who's worth a hundred million dollars. Like stupid. to me, to me is incomprehensible. Like I, I couldn't think about, you know, any of my business associates or, or people with money and, and, and status to pull out a phone around them and start going on IG live. Like th- that's not even a thought in my head, but, right. but that's exactly what happened. And now John Morant's, you know, future in the NBA is, is unknown. I mean, Adam Silver even said, you know, we're not sure what's going to happen right now. Right. He may be sitting out an entire season. He may be even kicked out of the NBA. I mean, you you don't know. I mean, you know, Gilbert Arenas ultimately got kicked out of the NBA right. over over a similar gun situation. Right. You know, when you look at situations like this, when you look at just being around your friends from your neighborhood and you love that energy and they all look up to you and it's always a party and you're the one with the money and everyone's pulling out phones and popping bottles. And then when the shoe drops and something goes wrong, Ultimately, only one person pays the price for this. Right, right. I, I mean, it's 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 super sad to see what happens to some of these guys because there's this there's this level of unknown, right, where you don't know no better. You know what I mean? Because they they have, I don't know, maybe. All right, so. On one end of things, you got people like um, like G Herbo and Lil Durk and and guys who uh, who really was from the mud and really from that. And when they make it, you know they they have to start to pull themselves away from that life. And their friends know that life all too well and know how tragic that it could end. That they if they do have a gun around, it's for safety. Or if they do, like, they, they're monitoring their movement, right? But when you have somebody who's influenced by that life, 
but isn't from that life. They have this, this level of them that's like, oh, this is cool. This is what you do once you get money. You go get a gun. You get some 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 friends who are are, are the tough guys. You know, we go get a bunch of nice cars and all of that. And it's really all peacock feathers for what they think is going to attract the women that are on IG with their ass out. Because that's what all this is for. You know what I mean? You want to be tough so girls like you. You don't want to be the nerdy kid who played basketball who ended up with 200 plus million. You don't want to be that guy. You want to be Lil Dirk. The guy who everybody looks at as tough. You know what I mean? And 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 it's sad, but like, that's that's what the culture feels like today. Oh, I like real niggas. I want a killer. I want this. I want that. I want 21 Savage, right? So you got a guy who busts his ass, who is a star. You know what I mean? He Ja Morant is a star, period, point blank. But he's so influenced by a, a culture that's full of, you know, guns, drugs, and ass shaking that these are the guys that you end up looking up to and these are the females that you want to spend your time with. And as a result, you get caught in the crossfire. Cause you, oh, yeah. You know what I mean? And it's, it's man, it's, it, you got to yeah. have people around you who love you, bro. Period. I mean, look, he's jamming out to NBA Young Boy, right? <laughs> <laughs> he's jamming out to NBA Young Boy. He pulls his pistol out, and and the ironic part about all this is that his friend, who's Facetime, who's IG Live, has 115 people watching. 115 people probably cost your man 115 million dollars. Exactly. 115 people. Like, that's damn near, like, you're almost FaceTiming at that point. There's so exactly. few people that are watching. <laughs> like, ain't like, nobody <laughs> really on there. You know what I mean? Right. Like, it's not like you got millions of people watching. You, you got 100 people watching, and one of them happened to record it. Right. Right? Which makes sense, because, oh, shit, Jabba Rant's on the live. Of course I'm going to press the record button. Right. Oh, that looks like a gun. All right, let me post this and get a whole bunch of likes. And then right. next thing you know, it goes it goes up the ladder to to the head of the NBA. Right, and that's and that's the saddest part about this all, right? The fact that you know whoever posted that video, or the people who are behind these videos and stuff these days, like the the length they're willing to go to, to maybe get pennies on the dollar or just simply likes or follows. Well, no, or whatever no, it's not they even got. pennies on the dollar. They're, it's just, to, they're it's literally simply likes. Yeah. Yeah, There's they're no really, money involved in reposting yeah, IG Live. Yeah, yeah they're, they're literally down to sever your career. They're down to sever your life. Like, you know what I mean? They're down to completely cut your lifeline off. You know what I mean? So you have to protect yourself even more than you did from the beginning. You know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, we've all done some idiot shit at 23 years old. We all have. Facts. Absolutely, we me included. All have, you know, and and the whole being cool thing was a thing when you were twenty three years old. Like, let's all be honest, you know what I mean. So to see it happen to Ja the way it did, it's like, man, it's the worst. But at the same time, like, once it happened to you once, you can't keep making them same mistakes. Well, but yeah, he did it twice, exactly, and that's, and that's where the problem lies at in, this in point. In the same it's amount like, of months, you know what I mean? Which is kind of like, yeah. bro, why do you need the gun? Like, why, where are y'all going? You know what I mean? Why are you, you know, and I haven't even seen these videos. Like I said, I, I kind of try to stay out of the, the media situations and take things for face value. But literally, if I scroll through my Instagram right now, everybody's making fun of John Morant. Like, it's, you know, but this shit ain't funny, man. It's sad. You know, we need to be having some classes. You know, some people need to be putting this together. You know what I mean? Like, if you ask me the, the, uh, the P. Diddy's of the world and people who have been celebrities through all of these different phases, you would think that they would have support groups damn near by now. You know what I mean? Like, really letting people know, hey, this is what it is. Like, Jamie Foxx, that's why I love that guy. Such a stand-up guy. I remember, um, you know, being at being at his crib with, you know, me, Chris Brown, um, just a few of us, you know what I mean? And he just really preaching to us, like, bro, like, I understand that y'all got to separate from from what you knew at one point in time, you know? So this is a safe place for y'all to be. You know what I mean? If you ever need anything, like, come to me first, you know? And I will forever be thankful for Jamie Foxx for that. You know what I mean? Like, it's 
the Hollywood Hills ain't the easiest fucking place to run to. You know what I mean? It ain't like I got a helicopter in my back pocket, but he always, you know, had his door open for for young guys like myself. And I think if we had more of that, we would have less of what's going on with John Moran. Sure. Well, yeah, I remember you had mentioned, uh, well, you made a video actually right after Takeoff got killed. Right. And you were really upset, especially at the people that are essentially filming him as he's lying on the ground bleeding. And, you know, listen, I... I did take off's first interview. I mean, him and, and Quavo, right, you know, like right. right when they were right before Versace came out. Right. <laughs> so, so, right. so this was, this was early, early in their career. Uh, and he was always like a quiet, nice dude. He wasn't the one that had drama in the group and everything else like that. And to, to see the way that played out, man, that, that broke my heart. And it yeah, seemed definitely. like it had the same effect on you. Definitely. Like it's, it's heartbreaking to watch that because as much as as black people at times want to complain about the police killing us or the white man holding us down, whatever it may be, like, we're not out here carrying our guns for them. You know, we're not out here spinning on them. They not the ops for real. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's not what's happening. It's black on black crime. It's pride. It's, it's, uh, all of these little things, like I said, because it's peacock feathers at the end of the day. For all we know, take off, you know, like somebody girl had a crush on him. For all we know. You know what I mean? We don't know why that man lost his life. But like at the end of the day, like he was never, ever that guy who had drama. He didn't. I don't even know if I ever really heard him raise his voice. Like, the loudest we've ever heard takeoff is in the ad-libs. Like, let's be honest. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, dude is uh, was such a chill person. And I'm like, man, this, it got to come to an end, bro. Like, it, it got to, like, I, I know violence, it has its thing, right? Because it's hard to tell somebody not to be mad after somebody loses their life. You know what I mean? Like, after somebody like that gets killed, you can only imagine that there'll be retaliation involved. Like, it really has to stop somewhere. You know, we are our own leading cause of death and demise. Like, that's that's too stupid. You know what I mean? Like, to, just to see this constantly show up in our neighborhoods and, you know, on, on our TVs and all of that. And you know what's going to happen? They're going to put you on a T-shirt. They're going to say, rest in peace a couple of times. You know, they might do this and that on TikTok for you, but you're going to be gone just like that, that fast. And ain't nobody going to care. You know, don't nobody care for real. Yeah, it's a it's a sad situation, and uh, you know, uh, to have a group broken up permanently like that over a dice game, essentially, right? A, a dice game gone wrong, uh, tempers flaring, in a situation where, just like in your own situation, you have a bunch of multi multi millionaires who are hanging out in public around a bunch of people with way less money than them. Exactly. With, exactly. with way less to lose, with, you know, anger issues and and so forth. When, yeah, an argument started off, you know, Quavo said, oh, let me get up out of here before I hurt somebody, which, which triggers another set of emotions. And next thing you know, a shootout happens and someone who's not even involved in the argument ends up dead on the ground. And another girl ends up getting shot in the head or something like that. It's just, it's bad on every level. Yeah, it is, and it's and it's it's crazy because I think um, having money just brings in this whole different level of toxicity to every situation that you're in, unless people around you have that same kind of bag, because they're gonna assume that you're trying to shit on them because you have the bag. Right. You know what I mean? Like, oh, let me get out of here for I, you know, who's not going to say that when when they might have just lost some money at a dice game or just won some money at a dice game and somebody going back and forth with them like tempers flare over this kind of shit, you know, but just because somebody comes out and says something and they got a different type of money than you. Now you got to prove it to them. You know what I mean? And, and like I said, man, it's all peacock feathers. That's what it's for, for somebody to sit back and be like, oh, he was tough, you know? He was. He was the hardest where we was from. Like, why do you want that? Why do you want that on your back? You know what I mean? 
Because everybody think they want to be killers until somebody else get killed in your neighborhood that you ain't had nothing to do with, and then people come raid your house, you know? Or you be sitting your ass behind them walls for, for life, you know? So many people who I know and came up with, they sitting behind them walls because they got in their feelings, you know, and wanted to be tough in front of the girl they like, and not a girl they like don't even remember they ass. You know what I mean? And that happens all the time, you know? And Unfortunately, we, we, we lose some golden members in these moments. Golden members. And it's it's sad, man. It's sad. But hopefully, um, you know, that's why I started this program, Dream Seeker. You know, I just went and spoke to this, spoke at a high school in Dallas called Bowie High School. And, um, you know, I was talking to some of these troubled youth. You know what I mean? And a lot of them have already been in in shootouts and already selling drugs and, you know, all of these things that we experienced as young people because, like, nobody really wants to be the bad guy. People want some money. You know what I mean? At the end of the day, it's like we hear what you're talking about, right? They bring you to the church and tell you, save your life and go to Christ and all of these different things. But you're like, you know, all this is fine and dandy, but show me how to make some money. You know, so I said, instead of just doing this over-the-counter acting class, that's only going to help 1% at best. Let me go teach my people how to fish and let me teach them how to actually make movies. You know what I mean? Let me show you what a a producer is. The first time I ever stepped onto a film set, I was like blown away. Like they had so many jobs. I'm like, I never even heard of this job. What do you do for a living? You know, and I really had to give myself a, a, a hard knocks School of Hard Knocks sort of uh, education on all of these different things that were happening because you really have to humble yourself and say, wow, it takes 50, 60 people to shoot a movie? Hmm, I wonder what these people do. So if, if I'm trying to do something great for my community, instead of just standing in front of them and shining, I'm saying, hey, let me, let me walk you down this street. You don't always have to have the, uh, the quote-unquote look for it and the quote-unquote talent for it, but you could really you know, buckle down and and learn this craft and be somewhere else, you know, make your $150,000 a year doing something that don't nobody even know exists. Because I think everyone tries to aspire to be in front of the camera, but there's only a certain number of slots in front of the camera. But (laughs) there's a whole lot more money a lot of times behind the camera. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Like the executives, like, you know, the guys who are running these studios, they don't, you don't even know what they look like. Right. You know, they could be right there in the room with you and they're worth two, three hundred million dollars. Exactly. You know, they're writing the checks to the people in front of the camera. Exactly. You know, and that's why, like, like I said, I'm so thankful for my friend Jaquavis Coleman, because anybody who knows his background, right? Like he's a writer and nobody self-publishes like him. Like he he goes hard with the self-publishing. But when he introduced me to this world of being able to invest in myself and what that comeback was like. I was like, oh, man. Uh, what? Like, don't get me wrong. I would I would be in a studio movie any day. Like, you know, I have no nothing against them. But am I going to wait on that? No, because it's not what's going to make me rich. For real. That's not what's going to make me wealthy. I could maybe get rich doing films for other people, but owning my own films is what's going to make me wealthy. That's going to have money in my my grandchildren's pockets, you know, leave yep. something for my great-grandchildren. Like, and it's going to come from this, you know? So, yeah, man, hopefully, you know, the the things that I went through and the struggles that I've overcome, people can actually look at and say, I learned something from that. And not only did I learn something from that, I actually got an opportunity from that same guy, you know, because that, that's what's going to change everything. The opportunities that we give ourselves, because we keep watching everybody running around in a circle and it's so scary that you're like, as much as I want to help, I got to get out of there. You know, I just I can't be in that environment, you know. So hopefully this this starts to break the chain of, of the foolishness that we constantly experience. And, well, yeah. I mean, I remember my first film project. It was called Ghost Ride the Whip. It was a documentary about the Bay Area and the okay. hyphy movement. This was in 2008. Uh, I directed it and, and produced it. 
you know, it came out through Image Entertainment. It, you know, it was on MTV and I think it was on Netflix for a while and everything else like that. I remember getting a $30,000 check up front and I never saw another penny for the rest of my life. <laughs> this came out like 15 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I remember right around that same time, that's when I decided to launch Vlad TV. And the understanding was, okay, I'm not going to get any upfront checks for this, but I'm going to own everything. Right. And I'm going to be able to monetize it forever. Right. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And 15 years later, that was by far, by far the best decision that I could have made. Because I could have stayed in the Hollywood circle. And okay, let me go get another documentary deal. Let me get a, a scripted, you know, a movie deal or whatever else. But I'm like, a lot of times, man, this paperwork is funny on the back end. They're always claiming they haven't recouped. And, you know, there's no way to really audit them. So I'm like, you know, fuck all this. I'm just going to own everything. Exactly. And I'll make a lot less money up front. I'm going to finance everything myself. But I'm going to have a catalog over time, that's going to be very valuable, which is what the movie studios have been doing the whole time. Exactly. They've been just building up their massive catalogs that they own outright, that they could, you know, bring back. They own the IP so they could do a reboot. They could do whatever with <laughs> exactly. it. But ultimately, they keep all the ownership. And yeah, they're putting up the money and they're not getting any checks up front. But the long-term play will always turn out better. And I think that's what you're realizing right now with your new film project and your new companies and everything else like that. And, you know. Yeah, yeah, man. It's, it is what it is. Yeah, because, like, to be honest, no matter how it may seem to anybody else, for people who have some of the biggest careers in Hollywood, it's still hurry up and wait, you know. Mm. At, at your best, you're doing, like, three films a year. At your best, you know. And it's just because time doesn't permit you to do everything. So it would behoove you to go in your bag and figure out something, you know what I mean? What am I going to produce that's going to be mine? Because you're going to take, you know, nine or 10 months out of your year making somebody else rich. You know what I mean? And you mm -hmm. might get a six, seven figure check, but I mean, it ain't going to last you for the rest of your life unless you invest that properly. And, you know, it ain't no better place to invest in yourself. Right. And, you know, for example, right now, the whole strike is happening in Hollywood with, with the mm -hmm. writers and so mm -hmm. forth. And, and I understand their point of view. But the reality is, is that the, you know, the financials of the movie industry is not what it was 10, 20 years ago. Exactly. You know, streaming, streaming has changed that. And a lot of the film companies are losing money. So you could sit there and complain and demand for higher wages and you could strike and you could band together and you could try to put pressure. But ultimately you're not going to get water from a rock. So exactly. at some point, like, yo, like we don't have the money. Right. And we have to figure out ways to cut costs to create these projects where they're going to be profitable. Because then what's the point of even doing this? Exactly. So, so instead of, you know, picketing and getting angry and, and trying to put pressure on these studios, go and make your own stuff. Yeah. And, YouTube and is free. Exactly. You know what I mean? that's, YouTube that's is, is, is a hell of a platform. You know, they got so many stories. Like, I'm not going to lie, man. If I see one more reboot, I'm going to fucking shoot myself. <laughs> I swear. I'm so tired of seeing them. You know what I mean? Either that or we're watching like Fast and Furious 25. You know what I mean? And right, it's like, yeah, exactly. yo, you know, like they act like they can't think of no more great ideas. You know, right. and, and we no longer have to deal with this whole beast of... Nobody's going to know I'm promoting my movie. You know what I mean? Like, when we did Straight Outta Compton even, bro, like, I think Mission Impossible had, like, 3,800 more screens than us or something. Just something crazy. But with, with, with streaming, you don't have to think about all of that stuff no more. Like, all you got to think about is hitting the mark. Like, let's make it good. Let's make it the best quality that it could be, you know? You might try to see a couple corners that you can cut. You know, let's use my house to shoot. Let's use my car. Let's save some money here and there. And, you know, but that's that's what makes it fun and that's what makes it yours. But at the end of the day, when that check come back and it got your name on it and it belong to you, oh, man, it's a whole different vibe. You know, yeah. it's a whole different vibe. That's what it is. Jason Mitchell, man, I appreciate you coming in. I've been a longtime right, fan. Uh, like I said before, the interview, I wanted to do this interview when Straight Outta Compton dropped, but you guys were on a crazy run and it was hard <laughs> to reach you and everything else like that. So finally, we got to do this. Uh, Easy e has been such a major influence on my life. Uh, it really, you know, he really kind of shifted my trajectory in my life because the music that he was a part of was so important that I essentially devoted the rest of my life to it. You know, That's and dope, I still, man. I still do it every day, and it's still that love, and it's always like, 
the artists that you admire before you ever got into the industry where it was just pure, you know, it was just like, I just love the music. I don't know the guy. I'll, I'll never meet him. Uh, it's all a fantasy to a certain degree, but I, I'm just in love with this music and this culture. And, you know, decades and decades later, this is still what I do every day. And you had such an important role for such a great film portraying him, which was not easy to do. Yeah, you know, man, it, it was, was not, it was not, it was not, it was very hard to pull off and you guys pulled it off so great. And you have so many other dope projects after that. Um, and regardless of all the hurdles that you have to deal with, you had to deal with that, that were thrown your way. You're still standing tall. You're still doing projects. You're, you're shifting into your own companies and uh, man, I love to see it. And I can't wait to see what else you got coming up. Man, thank you, my brother. Thank you. We might need you for something too. We're going to, we're going to get you a call. I we got you. you a call. I got you. I got you. I, I was I was in the boondocks back in the day. I don't know if you remember that episode, yeah. but there's a there's a cartoon version of me in the boondocks, yeah, which was one of my one of my highlights. I you know what I'm saying? It. I could do it. And uh yeah, man, whatever you need, I got you. Until I next time. I appreciate you, brother. Peace. Later.